So you've heard us talk many times about our 30 days of coaching program. And the reason why we try to get everybody involved with this is because we've put a lot of time and effort in to organizing this. We've just basically blurted out whatever is inside each one of our heads for 500 episodes. And a lot of times you can get lost in the sea of all that. What we did was we took a time stamp from when we spoke on a very specific topic. And so now you can just hyperlink and zoom into that particular topic, get versed in it. As you go through this, uh, we just hope that it helps you to peer into these topics in greater detail. So that's yeah, all. I mean, we cover everything, protein, carbohydrates, wellness, meditation, yeah, the neat principle, mobility, you know, it's, like all, all these different things that uh, we'd, we'd love to just sit and go into great detail about. It's all there for you to it's just like absorb an, it. It's your indexed. Convenience. It's indexed. It's yeah. a glossary. And we just you, each day is a different topic. It's uh, it's really cool. It's free. Mm-hmm. You get it at mindpumpmedia.com. It's fantastic. If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. So while we're at Paleo FX, we got an opportunity to meet with some pretty awesome people. One of those people was Josh Trent from Wellness Force Radio. It's a podcast that we really enjoy listening to. This guy's... um. He's got a very, very holistic and positive message. He's got an incredible story. Incredible story. We we had a lot lot of similarities with uh, our upbringing through uh, fitness. He actually worked for the same company as we all were. He was a fitness manager, right? Yeah, yeah. so we had a lot of things in common. A little bit different, though. He was the guy who was really overweight and was trying to find the answer, and that kind of led him down that path. And then he also learned about all the, the, the bad side to that and then has changed his kind of message now that he's out on his own. So we had a lot of fun recording oh, with God, him. Oh, God, what a great guy. We man. all sat down and just just went into it. Uh, his podcast, he talks about fitness and technology yeah. and how technology is applied to fitness. Just I love, love that part. Oh, I love that he addresses that because not a lot of people are talking about like how our world's changing and how we can really harness this technology for good. So mm-hmm. uh, You can find him on Instagram at Josh Trent, T-R-E-N-T, uh, or at Wellness Force. And his website is wellnessforce.com. So without any further ado, here we are talking to Josh Trent. Oh, yeah. God, welcome to MTV Cribs. We're here with Mind Pump. (laughs) We're just hanging out here talking about real shit. Hey, is that an Apple watch or is that a Nike watch? Both, my friend. Uh, <laughs> mind pump, welcome to Mind Blown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's whatever awesome. I want it to be today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or what if you went plus, like this, you're like, uh, what do you Apple think watch. it is? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you tell me. That would have yeah. been, yeah, that would have been a better answer for sure. <laughs> Damn it. We'll talk I, tech. Yeah, you and me. Fuck yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great. These guys, fuck them. Yeah, let's do this. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I'm on it. Yeah. Yeah, so back to what I was uh, bringing up to you is a guy that's been in the industry for as long as you have. You grew up in the same company we did. Yeah. Uh, learned a lot from them. We were just talking about how uh, you know, we don't want to sit here and bash or talk shit about a, a great company like that that we all uh, learned a lot from when we started. Right, so yeah. I always I refer Finish to the, I refer to them as like my bad parents. Yeah. Like I love them, <laughs> yeah. I still love right. them because they're my parents, and I learned like they did a lot of things the wrong way, and so. Yeah. That's how I, I, I think of 24-Hour Fitness. Like they're for, good providers, but they're a little abusive. <laughs> yeah, just a little. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like a little bit. <laughs> yeah. You can say, you you say that. Yeah. But I find it fascinating when you see, when you see that and then you, you have uh, kind of like what Mind Pump is about is we're, we talk about all this stuff and we've exposed a lot of the, the gimmicks and the bullshit in the fitness industry. And a lot of the ways that we do that is by sharing our own stories that we used to we used to do all that shit. I mean, I used to we used to close hard on people's emotions and feelings. And then you see a company like Planet Fitness that's coming up. And this company is it, the extreme even worse than company. They are targeting people that they know are not going to stick to anything and they put the membership so low that you know it's like a no oh to have a gym membership nine dollars a month or 19 or whatever the fuck it is yeah it's like it's a no-brainer and they get and i could get free pizza let's see here to do the math i mean that pretty much <laughs> free pizza monday <laughs> seriously i mean it's such a it's it a, seems kind of blasphemous though doesn't it, it? well uh, yeah just a little bit that's or, or how about gyms that have coca-cola and pepsi in the machines what's yeah, up with that yeah that's mm. that's true that's like free going workout. to a church and swearing yeah <laughs> That's yeah. really what you're doing. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah I mean, uh, you know, planet uh, companies like Planet Fitness, you can't really blame them because they're doing 
they're they're utilizing a tactic that's very effective. It's been yeah. proven. Yeah, to yeah, be shame effective. on us. Shame well, on us. It's 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 been proven to be very effective. We were part of a company that kind of mastermind a little bit of that model, right? Of like the big box model is you sell a lot of memberships and you hope people don't use your club and you make sure the price is low enough to where it doesn't make sense to cancel it because I'm only paying X amount of dollars per month or per year. And knowing that model, understanding that model, that's where a lot of the money goes. We were just talking about like most of our training. I'll tell you what, I, I worked as a, as a trainer at 24 Hour Fitness and you know, you had your certification and most of the money and energy from 24 Hour Fitness goes to teaching you how to sell training. Mm-hmm. It does not go to, te- to making you a better yeah. trainer. like the most awesome trainer yeah. ever. Yeah. Not at all. So, and that's just that, that's just that model that just seems to work so well on our emotions. Well, it was, it was six years into my career before. I'll never forget seeing this slide. I'm at, we were at a, a big kickoff meeting and I'm like, I'm five years into being a fitness manager at this point. And we've, like you said, we've been so focused on training sales. That's, I just, I taught sales all day long. That's what I taught. I mean, as a fitness yeah, manager. For five, yeah, right. For five <laughs> years of my career, that's what I taught. I taught people yeah. how to close and, and, how to, and how to like sell somebody on a program and based off of like whatever you wanted to create. And I told, I used to tell my trainers, they could create that for them. You create that right now. It's not something tangible, you know, so it's yeah. something that you paint that picture for them. So I put that much energy on on the sales piece. Five years comes in. I'm, I'm looking up at this projector, and they have the stats of a trainer with a level one certification, level two, level three, level four, and then a master trainer, right? And in order to be a master trainer back in those days, you had to have 5,000 hours and at least three national certifications and or a degree. You got the field. special yeah. black shirt as well. Exactly. Oh, yeah. That's with right. the white lettering. Oh, on the man. Back, right? You better believe you I, know what? I got That's my after master training well, status. So this was what was crazy. It was when I saw, and then the, to the right of all that was uh, how long they stayed yeah, in the, the company. The retention. Yeah, yeah. How long they stayed in the company, the average sessions mm. that they serviced, the amount of money that they sold every month. And it was like, holy shit, if we can just get them educated and get them up to this level. Well, you're the only one that really hacked into that. Like I, well, I, in our area, for sure. In our area, yeah, because I remember that was the big push then is to, for, to get us all enough certification so we could move our way up in, in the pay grade. Yeah. And it's like I, I felt like there was just that – wasn't, that wasn't the vibe. That wasn't the thing that was taught, you know, is how to maximize your time there and make the most amount of money. And it was getting more educated at the same time. It was a mm-hmm. no-brainer. Well, I think gyms aren't the only one that are at fault. I think the whole industry is like that. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's everywhere. How did how did you start your career in fitness? Was it as a trainer there? Yeah, I was actually in, in Hawaii. I was 280 pounds at one point. So, oh shit! Yeah, when wow, I grew great. up, when I grew up, I did not have the right psychological or physiological tool sets uh, from my parents. Mm. So at some point, I just realized I was actually. I remember I'll never forget this. I was at a party. I was drinking beer out of a red cup, and I slammed the cup down because I tried to lose weight for like a year on and off. And I was like, "There's more to life than this." And I just got so angry. I ran home drunk for like three miles. <laughs> and when I got home, I pulled over my HP, the old school laptop that weighed like fifty pounds, and I typed in, "How do I be healthy?" And that was what led me on this path. Wow, fantastic! Yeah. So then I ended up selling everything I owned. I moved to Hawaii. No uh, shit. I was twenty two years old. And I was just like hiking, surfing, and fishing. And I was working out at a 24-hour fitness there. And the fitness manager came up to me. He's like, hey, have you thought about being a trainer? And I was like, what's a trainer? I didn't know what personal training was. And so I was like trying to do this path of wellness on my own. And I mm. thought, oh, my God, this is a catalyst. I can help other people mm-hmm. to do what I'm doing. And so then that led me in my career. Yeah, and the next wow. 10 years was just like absorbing as much fitness as I could and certifications and just... Yeah, the master trainer shirt with the black. Hair. <laughs> That's it. Man. How long yeah. were you at? Tw- how long were you at twenty four for? Uh, like six years. And then did yeah. you do something afterwards? Uh, actually, I after I got out of twenty four, I took all my clients and went to a private studio across the street. A lot of people did that. Yeah, it was called mm-hmm. High Voltage Fitness in La Jolla, right across the street. A lot of people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's great. So yeah, the new fitness manager would come in upstairs and like look down at the new studio uh. across the street. But um, yeah, that was my journey, man. It was it was birthed from pain. Like I felt so uncomfortable. And I hated my body so much that I knew there was more. Like my authentic self just knew, but I wasn't exactly sure how to do it. And you just so. 180 right away. Yeah. Well, it was over the course of like two years mm. to really lose weight. 
Mm. Yeah. Well, to really let well, the your weight, mindset though. To yeah. really let the did you down. did you find yourself gravitating to a company, a brand, or any message in like general out there? Or were you listening to podcast? Was podcast? Yeah, podcasting's going on. Two thousand four, two thousand five. No. Not really. Uh, I mean, even having a laptop then. I'm, I'm old enough to know what it's like to have a pager. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, like, yeah. We're so, all the same age. Dude, then. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, but no, you know, the brands that I gravitated towards at that age was like um, honestly just music. Music. Like I was 22 years old. I was listening to like Ludacris. I was listening to like Incubus. So I didn't have any fitness brands or any personalities and wellness that I was like really attracted to or really felt pulled to. Yeah. I just knew there was something greater. I didn't, I didn't know exactly what it was, but I knew it was something, you know, and I think people find their catalyzing power through fitness first. And then along the journey, they're like, oh, fitness is actually the first step. It's really wellness that we're looking for. Right. And mm. then that's what led me to found wellness force in my company. That's cool. Yeah, oh, that's very yeah. I cool. think looking at uh, look, it's really interesting being because I've been doing this for twenty years as a professional. I've been fitness for that long, and I've seen more. Notice the gray hairs. Yeah, that's right. Wisdom, still, wisdom. Yeah. Yes, it's wisdom. Hairs. Those are wisdom hairs. W- wisdom. Um, it see, uh, it feels like, and I don't know if it's because I'm in it so deep now, and I don't know. Maybe you guys can agree with me, but it feels like the last. I've seen more changes in the last five years than I did in the previous almost fifteen. Well, isn't that across the board with everything though? I mean, it, I mean, it feels like everything is. Moore's law, right? Everything yeah. or everything is like compounding. Like if if it's it's trained, I tell you what, man. I so I owned a, a personal training studio, so I had my own gym in there. So I worked out in there for twelve years, which meant I wasn't in big box gyms. So I had my clients do my own thing, and I wasn't really paying attention to the trends of the big box gyms. I went in there uh, into one of them. I think it was uh, it might have been Gold's Gym, and you know what surprised me that there were all so many squat racks. Hmm. I mean, there, nobody was squatting when, you know, back when I was in these big box gyms. We had yeah. in a massive 30,000, 40,000 square foot facility, you'd have like two squat yeah, racks. All machines. It, yeah, it'd be like, it's honest to God. And then I go into a, a Gold's and I went into a 24 hour fitness. I'm like, whoa, they got cages. Like, look at all these cages. This is interesting. And people started lifting weights a little bit differently. Oh, I was, yeah. a, I was a fitness manager before I even taught a squat. Was literally a fitness manager <laughs> telling teaching trainers what to do before I had even taught my first squat on yeah. somebody. That's how much it was neglected back then. Well, I, th- I think there's that part, and then there seems to be this wellness piece that uh, I'd say over the last five years, I'm really starting to see a little bit of mm. crossover into that world. You know, well, the, that the, was that was our message <laughs> from the very beginning. Was like, how do we? We saw like a big gap there between fitness and wellness, and in the division there of like where where the message really was in fitness. It was just, I mean, we weren't really helping people on that level where we were helping their health. And uh, we just, we were trying to figure that out. Like, how can we combine the two together? How can we get people back into the wellness mind of things? And, and Sal had, you know, that experience coming from his gym, kind of already um, having people in there that were part of that wellness um you know, physical therapy. Well, I really started to notice it when I started to put two and two together, being a numbers guy. And I love looking at analytics. I started looking at like, I thought of myself as a really good trainer and my clients aren't really that successful if I'm truly honest with myself. Yeah. And that was when it really like dawned on me, like, wait, I think I'm good at this and I'm still like 20% successful. That's not fucking good. So something's wrong. Like the message is wrong, whatever it is. And I'm part of that, giving that message. And so for me, that's when it, it really started of starting to question that. And it took a long time because it took me a long time to go, well, I've trained probably hundreds, thousands of people by now. And it's like, why haven't I kept them? For, yeah. Yeah. You know, why don't why I, why, why, don't, why don't I have these relationships with these thousands of people that I've, because I know when I do change someone's life, especially now where you really, really help them connect the dots and, and work on their relationship with food, with their relationship with exercise and themselves. When you really help someone, man, they're forever connected to you. Yeah. Yeah. And I should have thousands of people connected to me for that reason. But I, the, the information that I was sharing and giving was all the wrong information, in my opinion, because – and we just got into this debate recently on uh, – who was it? It was uh, – it wasn't Lane. Was it Lane? No, 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 no. no. It was, what, it was a, that doctor. I don't remember his name. But, yeah, we, yeah. Were, we, were, we were going back and forth on uh, – you know, there was a recommendation for uh, protein powder instead of burger and fries. And it was just, it was like an old... Um, Slim Fast. You remember Slim Fast commercial? Yeah. Eat a sensible dinner, eat a <laughs> yeah. sen- you know, sensible lunch and have Slim yeah. Fast for dinner or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It was equivalent to that. And so it was, it was showing option one, sensible dinner, fast food lunch, sensible, or excuse me, sensible breakfast, fast food lunch, sensible dinner. Then option two was, 
you know, breakfast and dinner were sensible and you had a protein shake instead. And yeah. It's like, you know, great. This is a great way to lose weight. And the message just hit me, man, like a, like right in my nerve. And like, I got to fucking say something. And it, start, it sparked this freaking huge debate online. Um, and, you know, with people arguing semantics, you know, it's a doctor, it's an obesity specialist. And he's saying stuff like, look, cut your calories, you're going to lose weight. And I'm like, nobody's arguing that. That's, sure. that's, that's, uh, there's no, you can't argue that. that. Of course, that's going to happen. But having done this as long as I have and having worked with as many people as I have, there are ways we can do things that will give people long-term lifetime uh, results. Um, and, and not just the cosmetic of weight loss, but actually being healthier and feeling better about themselves uh, in true ways. And then there's ways that we can you know, train people or teach people that we've been doing for the last, God, meal replacement powder has been around for a long time. Mm-hmm. Doctors have been prescribing with people for a long time. They don't fucking work. It's not as easy as, you know, taking less calories, move more, and that's it. And so... Yeah, but this calories in, calories out model, we've known for so long that it's broken. It's mm-hmm. not true at all. Yeah. So I think what you're really touching on is the old system of you see somebody twice a week, there's 164 hours where you're not seeing them. Mm-hmm. So even if they have the slim fast shake or whatever it is, they need smarter touch points. Yeah. These people need real emotional connection with their coaches. Or their trainers. Well, not only that, and, but... And, and training's never going to go away. Yeah, yeah. But it just needs to evolve. And I think technology can help it do Ooh. that. Well, well I remember... I, I mean, Let's I remember <laughs> one big turning point for me was I had a client who, you know, we were training together and I, I had her on the schedule for three days a week and she came to me and told me she can only now train once a week. Uh, life circumstances weren't allowing her to make it to the to work out with me that much. Yeah. Plus, it was a cost issue because three days a week of personal training would be kind of quite expensive. And I remember thinking, like, I'm going to have a come to Jesus talk with her. Like, if you're only going to work out once a week. As he's wearing a Darwin shirt. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. If, uh, you know, Irony. working out once confused. a week. Irony. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Is, uh, uh, you you're can't way- use a Jesus reference yeah. with a Darwin I'm shirt. I'm sorry, Haley, get away with that. I know. Yeah. Lightning, bro. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was going to have a come to Darwin talk. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and, uh, and you know, I was going to tell her, like, you're wasting your time. I was going to try and motivate her. If you're not working out three days a week and, you know. And she didn't come anymore. And... It hit me like, man, I'd done that so many times before. Like, wait a minute. This woman now is doing nothing. I have not benefited her at all. She's gone because I have this mentality of fitness that is super ineffective. And so you just start looking at things and say, okay, how can I become much more effective with my message so that people uh, do this for themselves? They maybe don't need me anymore. The funny thing is clients would stay with me at that point now, 10, 12, 15 years. But uh, it was so much more effective from that standpoint. You had built such a connection with them, though. You had shared memories, and you had had PRs that you had helped them through, and you had really kind of built them up from the ground as far as their physical ability, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, that's a big reason why they stayed with you. I mean, sometimes when I'd be in a session, I'd realize, like, this was just something they do after their nail appointment. And, like, that's the real thing for some of Mm -hmm. these people. So, Mm -hmm. how do we shift this training model to work? I think we do it because people are on their phones. People are using technology. Like, let's harness tech a little bit so we can help these people get healthy when they're not in the gym. Because, to be honest, like, I love the gym. But who wants to go to the gym so much when really, like, nature's calling out there? Oh, absolutely. So, uh, let me ask a tech guy like you then. uh, Over the last 10 years, uh, what tech have you, uh, or what do you think has been some of the best tech for fitness? Hmm. Uh, and what are the things you think that are worse or set us what's back? What's going to lead the way? Yeah, I think what's going to lead the way is smart wearables with virtual coaching. Hmm. Like taking something in the gym, not changing the trainer element. Think of it like Spotify. Spotify is awesome because you can get any song you want at any time. What if you had a Spotify model to training where you hmm. came with your trainer, you train once a week with your trainer or even bi-monthly? But then you had access to them 24-7 through an app where you could talk to them. You could send exercises to them. It would be like going to the trainer, but you're not actually in the gym. But you're still held accountable because your data that your body creates doesn't lie. Like if you're not sleeping correctly, if you're not stepping correctly, if you're not doing enough uh, workouts, Mm -hmm. the trainer can see that. And so then it turns into like the old beatdown model was come into the gym three times a week and, you know, I'll kick your ass. I'll crush you in a session and you'll feel great. But then how does that really help your wellness? What helps your wellness is the 165 hours out of the gym. So if we can have this mirror of mindfulness for clients through the mm. device, that's powerful, man. So you know who's, you know who's building feedback. all the content for that right now? Probably Apple. Yeah. <laughs> Mind Pump's building a lot of that content right that's now. What we're oh, trying good, to, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's trying to a lot, lot. The, the idea of, of what we're doing with the, the podcast coupled with uh, the YouTube channels 
is to and every day there's a new video that's getting dropped and they complement all the programs and the one thing that we knew was going to be so tough for us was okay how do we especially since we're all like anti classes and it's all about trying to individualize it for a person and how do you do that when you're speaking to the masses or in a group and so how do we create these individualized programs so what we do with people is we help them understand when they're going through these exercise programs that you find online uh, they're learning how to program for themselves and we use all the videos on the YouTube to complement each one of the programs based off of what they need and it has like a full assessment that they take on themselves and then that kind of guides them and each one like guides them through steps and then explains why and if they have issues that they can't do it then that shoots you over to the YouTube channel for these exercises for you to work on or these priming movements or corrective exercise you so I mean we've been building those the, all that content out now for about two and a half years I mean, we still, I still feel like we have quite a ways to go and we're probably what 300 or so YouTubes plus another 600 plus videos for. So, I mean, information has been out there for a long time and there's a lot of ways to access that information. Um, but I mean, is that going to be the solution? Do you think? Yeah. There, there's a bridge between knowing and doing just because information's out there, just because people know of something doesn't mean they're going to take inspired action. Right. So, so, so how do you do that? Right. What's, you, that's the you, question. Do that, you do that through smart touch points and human connection. So you have somebody like, for example, I work with a company called nudge coach. I have a platform. All my clients wearable data is there on a dashboard for me. So I can see everything they're doing. I can see how they're sleeping. I can see their quality. I can see how sedentary versus active they are, which is huge. If somebody is like sitting on their ass for 13 hours and they work out for an hour at a CrossFit box, like that's great, but it didn't really take away the 13 hours that they were sedentary. So it's getting smart data so you can actually give somebody the right message at the right time. So I can check in with people throughout the week without spending an hour with them. I can just shoot them a message because I get a notification that they've been sedentary for too long. So it's, mm. another, it's another way for virtual coaching, but with yeah. much more information on your client, much yeah. different and points. And you're trying to, to coach it with. from being a coach. Like, you're not trying to get them super fixated on their numbers, totally. right? You're trying to oversee this and you're which, that's the biggest curating piece. their no, I yeah. mean, the psychological piece. Is which, the biggest which is piece the way the that I see it will work. Uh, I feel with all this biofeedback and, and um, what's out there currently, um, I just I feel like people can get stuck on these numbers or they could – you know, misuse these numbers yeah. or not understand these numbers completely. And, and for, for most of it, the only relevant ones, in my opinion, happen to be, you know, step count and, you know, maybe heart rate to some degree. How do you feel about heart rate variability, for instance? I think it's awesome. I use HRV4 training, which is you put your finger on the camera on the iPhone. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And so I just know if it's red, green, or yellow, should I train hard? Should I relax? Mm -hmm. It's a very simple thing for me. There are people that use HRV for like predicting heart attacks and they, they go way deep. Like HRV, there is so much information out there about it. I just think like, should you train hard? Should you rest? Mm -hmm. Or should you take it like a normal training mm -hmm. day? I think that's the biggest indicator. But at the end of the HRV. day, it boils down to the trainer. It's always going to boil, boil down. down always going to boil down to the trainer because I think it's... Uh, information has been out for a long time. There's lots of ways to access information. There's... Uh, you can, you can push yourself to try to motivate yourself to get in shape. But you know, what I look at is I look at the industry and I say, okay, what are the things that have worked? And how can we take that and maybe make it even better? And the one thing, the one thing that I can see that has actually worked is feeling a sense of uh, camaraderie. And you see that with fitness facilities, these small facilities that you walk into and everyday people who've never worked out before go in there and then they don't leave for like 15 years or 20 years, which is insane because the average person exercises for, a th uh, you know, one to three months and well, then you know who, does You know again. who's doing this very well right now? That's Orange Theory. Orange Theory is doing mm -hmm. that model very well of building this tight little community. And that's and, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's what's working. Yeah. I mean, they're exploding. And, CrossFit yeah. blew up because of that. That's really what made CrossFit. Well, so I'll tell you what's see, and here's the thing: you watch the difference of a company like Orange Theory and CrossFit is pay attention to how fast Orange Theory catches up to them because of the way they're they're more tech, yeah. Yeah, like the way they're evolving tech wise is so much faster. Yeah, and they're, they're I, mean, I mean they're already on they're they're more organized about mm -hmm. their growth. Where I feel like CrossFit right now, I, I feel is having to put out some well, so it, shit right now. Well, see, because I, and I can it, point, it, I can tell, I, and I think what I think some of the, some of the holes that, that Orange Theory will have, which is why they're tapping into that camaraderie and that group, you know, energy together, which has always been successful. 
But, um, you know, uh, I think they need to have an area for individualized training to be com- to combine with that just so that well, number Boston, one, their talent. Boston Burn does it like Boston that, which, Burn is, does brilliant, that, is, which brilliant. is brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. So I think it's got that, you know, that component to it. And also, if you look at, now this is the trainer in me talking, right? If you analyze the workouts themselves, uh, the intensity-focused uh, model of fitness has a track record of short-term success, and it has a horrible long-term success rate. I mean, things that are real intense and exciting and make you jump a lot and sweat a lot, yeah. they, they're Tybo or whatever, they get real popular because people love them for like, you know, a little while. Hot before they go into adrenal fatigue, yes. For, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, yeah. I'm, let's say I'm taking it a step further. I mean, we're talking about all these different ways we can communicate with clients, but let's talk about the message. Like, you know, what if a place like that also had a yeah. meditative uh, aspect to it or something? Now, you're mm-hmm. talking about long-term success. I think what you're touching on, too, is like everything needs a proper orientation. Mm-hmm. So the way that you would assess a client, like you need to assess their emotions just like you would their overhead squat. Mm-hmm. It needs to be the same thing. And so like the behavior change component, a second podcast that I have is fitness plus technology. And so I interview all these different companies and leaders that are trying to bring tech into the fitness industry. Mm. And a lot of them are so focused on like the platform or how cool the tech is or the gadget. Yeah. They forget about the behavior change behind it. They right. forget about like the emotional the why. context. Yeah. yeah, like why you're doing it. Why are you doing this? Yeah. And, and so if you look at people like um, Bobby Capuccio, he's a speaker in, in fitness industry. He is so intelligent when it comes to like mm. neuroscience and behavior change. And how do you combine those two things and put that into a wearable and put that into Now a that program. would be that would be absolute yeah, money. Be, that's where powerful. the industry's going. That's yeah. that's truly where the industry. You really going. think so? I believe that's that. fantastic because this is what the people are talking to that have the money. Well, here's <laughs> right? you know here's what I'm thinking. Like you know, yeah. it, 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 instead of asking you your like your weight and how many calories you weigh, you know, it's like okay, what did you eat? Why did you eat that? How did you feel? Were you happy? Were you well, sad? This is going how's in- your how's your energy today? Like all these yeah. different kind of questions, and then because of the you know whatever's in the app, the the the, the algorithm or whatever that they decide it's able to connect dots for people. Yeah. And when you can get those emotional connections to things like, oh man, every time I eat chocolate, I'm an asshole that an hour coupled, later. Yeah. Imagine that coupled with urons, what he's yes. building right oh, now. Oh, yeah. with a continual glucose Neutrino. monitor. Neutrino. Yeah. <laughs> Have you... Oh, Rob Wolf wore that on his arm. He did that for wear. Yes. Did you yeah. read yeah. that book? Yeah. I loved it. I, I interviewed Rob. I read the book. And I was like, that is the coolest shit I've ever seen. Yeah. Right? How interesting is that? Finally, How nearly you and individual variants. I, we ha- I feel like we have to put, put him together. We do. Yes. 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 We're going to introduce yeah. you to this guy. He's Let's brilliant. Go. You're gonna, yeah. yeah. You're going to yeah. geek yeah. the fuck yeah. out. But I mean, how, 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 <laughs> totally. how, ins- how totally. insane is that, that you had people with these continual glucose monitors yeah. who were, they would eat a cookie, get a spike in glucose, eat a banana and not so bad. And, and you then expect eat rice. That. But then, no, then you get people who are the opposite. They would eat a cookie and have a great... Uh, sugar response and they need a banana and it would spike through the roof right or you had people eating a like a fat meal and then they'd get this crazy glucose response and i the, I, th- I think they were speculating that it might be like an immune response to the food or something maybe well, a food intolerance it's also because like all of us have a thumbprint but it's so different mm-hmm. the same internal thumbprint our mm-hmm. our bio individuality yeah. is different for every human no one is alike Mm-hmm. Everybody's different, so we cannot Genetic, apply a environmental blanket. all those factors. Yeah, and then yeah. you factor in epigenetics, and then and then everything else that we encounter: pesticides and our environmental toxins. I state mean, of I, mind, state of mind. <laughs> so, like, there's so many things that go into like if a nutrition program or a movement program, training program will work. Mm-hmm. It's not just because your neighbor does it doesn't mean it'll work for you. Mm-hmm. Period. Yeah. No, and so I, what it, what have you found that does work for you now, or like in the last decade? Yes. Like I have a yeah. handful of tools. Name that specific I think, tools. Yeah, yeah exactly. I there's a what, lot of them out there. Yeah, that you have used, and then you felt very useful. For yeah. You. Well, I have um, my whole life. I've had anxiety issues, like my whole life, and so I actually I just recently did uh, Mark Divine Seal Fit event, which was the 20x which brought me to my psychological knees, <laughs> like one of the most challenging physical events. But I did the, phys- the physical crucible because I wanted to figure out what it would be like for me to have a moment in my life where the voices were completely turned down. Because when I wake up in the morning, still, even as a wellness coach, even as somebody who's been banging away at this craft for years, like I still have those voices inside. And a lot of people talk about this, like the voices don't go away. It's how we can respond to the voices instead of be reactive to the voices. And so what do I think is the best for me for technology? It's meditation. Tell me you've used it, Brain FM. I haven't used Brain FM, but, but, but my tool, you guys asked me about a tool. Yeah. So I am aware of the anxiety. The tool that I use is mindfulness meditation. And what I do to track that is to get into my alpha two 
which is really like the flow state. And I do that through the Muse, the brain sensing mm-hmm. headband. Mm-hmm. So that's, for me, that's been the ultimate. Now, when you, so you talk, how, does that, how does the Muse work? Are you trying to stay within a certain, because you can't be conscious of that right while you're doing it. Totally. It, it's, um, it's a continuous practice where you wear it and you breathe. You either do a uh, visualization meditation. You could maybe do box breathing while you're meditating. But when you're done with your session, you can look at, hey, this is showing me from my temporal lobe, this is what state my brain was in for my entire session. And so you can see like, all right, next time I meditate, I'm going to do the breathing one because that worked better for me. I see. Or, oh, I noticed in meditation, I keep having this thought come up from my ex-girlfriend that pisses me off. Okay. How am I going to work on that in my life? So it's little mirrors of mindfulness Mm. that can not only help to quiet the voice, but also put you in the right state that's going to help you for the rest of the day. Now, have you been doing that's this for a while now? I've been doing it for two years. For two years and it made yeah. a big difference with your anxiety? It made a huge difference. So you were still yeah. dealing with that kind of anxiety up until about two years ago? Absolutely. Wow. Well, well, guys, like like total transparency, yeah. like, I still have anxiety. Mm. Yeah. So What's the difference? Yeah. Uh, the difference is, is that I recognize the feeling. I'm aware of the feeling, but I don't allow it to bridge to my actions. So I have- put practices Yeah, in. like I have the awareness. Like, like even before I came over here, I had anxiety. But like, I'm not going to let it affect our cool conversation. Sure, sure, know? absolutely. So it's just something I'm aware of. I just, I just fucking practice at it so that I'm not allowing it to control me. So who was yeah. that? There was this one, she was on Tom Bilyeu's show, uh, show that, Dude, la- I, that Tom, lady, Tom, uh, yeah. the, the yeah, five great. second rule lady. Mel Robbins. Yeah, and she was talking about anxiety and yeah. this one blew me away because it's, I mean, when you hear it, you're like, oh shit, that's obvious. But yeah. all of the physical things that happen to you when you're anxious, the excitement in your chest, the, the cold hands, the you know all the all the physical things that happen to you are the same things that happen to you when you're excited. So uh, being excited and being anxious from a physical standpoint is the same thing. And so she was like, M- maybe just tell yourself, well, switches yeah. maybe just tell yourself you're excited. Yeah, and I was like, holy shit, that was <laughs> fucking mind blowing for me. <laughs> yeah. Because once I, yeah. I mean, I too can get anxious. I can feel anxious, which a lot of people. When that know me, th- they they typically don't, you know, they think, are you know, you got to be kidding me, right? Because I talk so much. That's part of my, my people anxiety. don't know. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, that's I'm part of the things that I do. Too. Like you're yeah. so good that's at managing it that, that yeah. people don't know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. They'll never, they'll never and, know. But that one rule right there of uh, kind of being like, oh wait a minute, I'm just excited because half the time I am. Most mm-hmm. of the time I am. Most of the time I'm not anxious about shit. I'm just excited because something new is about to happen. Mm. I so, felt that I felt that way about box breathing. I, the first time I did that, I was like blown away. Because yeah. you mentioned like uh, we are, we're, where we're all very similar is none of us sleep at night. Everyone has that going yeah. around. And Brain FM is what changed it for me. But before that, yeah. when I first started doing box breathing, I was like, holy shit. I just totally, I could feel my whole body right after it. I think I did like seven seven or eight of them, Mm -hmm. not even that long. And it was like, whoa. And that for me, that paired with like brain FM is. Well, because you're, you're getting out of fight flight, you're turning on parasympathetic nervous system. So Mm -hmm. you're just dropping in Mm -hmm. and I'll, and I'll be even more real. Let's go go like three more fathoms deep. Yeah, let's Uh, do this. uh, Warrior (laughs) breath at Mark Devine's event where it was kind of like a Wim Hof method where we took it for 30 minutes breathing. Uh Half the room was in tears. Grown Mm -hmm. men. Yeah. Tears. Mm-hmm. Because we have emotions that are stored in our muscle tissue, in our nervous system that come out through breathing, holotropic mm-hmm. breathing, through ayahuasca, through psilocybin, through intense exercise. Uh, people massage. That do, people that do marathons cry. Yeah, yeah. massage. Deep so, massage can do this. You know, I, I, I have some personal friends that are massage therapists and they'd be like, you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe the people that cry on my table when mm-hmm. I'm working on a tight area or whatever. Do you think yeah. memories are, I've heard people say, yeah. you know, and I, I worked very, very close with a very... In uh, impactful uh, massage therapist for years and I learned uh, uh, quite a bit from her but she would say things like you know literal memories are stored in our body and she's kind of that you know out there kind of person so I was like okay well you know I think I know what she means but whatever yeah. but then I've heard other people say that they're literally stored in your body as if uh, uh, it's got a memory to these types of things do you think that's what it is or do you think they were use it just as a way to explain yeah, I asked Dr. John Solomon about this. He wrote The Brain Always Wins. I had him on the podcast. Incredible guest that you guys get okay. to talk to. Mm. And he said, we don't really have muscle memory. What we have is neuron memory, where every time we move, it 
tells our brain to code that signal in. So when you ask, is there memories that are stored in the muscle tissue? I don't think they're physically stored in the muscle tissue, but I think when that tissue is activated, like through SMR or through like, you know, say Gosky, perfect whatever sense. it is, makes perfect whatever sense. it is, the brain remembers okay. that that part got excited and then the brain might have the memory stored in there. But I don't mm. think physically now, that, it's stored that, that, that makes perfect sense because- yeah. I, think I, a great, I think there's a great explanation. That's there. a great explanation. And I'll tell you, mm-hmm. uh, we've all experienced this. You have, have you ever smelled something and instantly you're taken to a memory? Hell week in football when the grass yeah. is just right. <laughs> right? Dude, right? Yes. Or you just, yeah. you smell yeah. something, you're like, oh fuck, this is like yeah. sixth grade classroom or whatever, Mrs. Yeah. Whatever's class. <laughs> I, and, and it's because there's a part of your, the part of your brain that remembers things is so close to the part of your brain that perceives smell yeah. that they kind of cross a little bit. So what he are saying makes Protein perfect farts. sense. Well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. It brings me back. That's a memory back, of its own. Mass it building back. days. Yeah. But yeah, it makes perfect sense that, you know, certain movements or exercises or massage will activate these types of tissues. Yeah. You brought up the, uh, you know, things like psilocybin, ayahuasca. That's on a whole other level. That's a whole other level, man. And I, and I think that it's not for everyone. Like there are some people that, there are some people that uh, should play in that realm and there are some people that shouldn't, mm. right? Yeah, I, so. uh, I know for me, um, uh, my, I've used cannabis as a tool for, uh, I, I first started using it for, um, to help me with my gut health because it was so effective at, uh. Uh, with its anti-inflammatory properties. And I had gone through a period of time where I had pretty severe autoimmune issues. And I used cannabis um, in, on vacation. I was on vacation and we had bought some you know, pot and it was shitty weed or whatever. And I had, a, I had had someone else like in high school. like weed with <laughs> seeds in it. Yeah, it yeah. wasn't. It, Brick but, weed. But brown. we smoked it all day and I could eat whatever I wanted and all of a sudden my gut was fine, but I didn't connect the two I come back and I thought to myself, it was because I was relaxed. Oh, I was on vacation. That's why my, my digestion was so good. I come back to the States. I start eating better than I was on vacation. And I had all these issues come back. And then I started make, connecting the dots. And that's when I started using cannabis. But I also find cannabis uh, can be effective at helping with uh, anxiety. Um, but it can also uh, make anxiety much worse. Yeah, I feel like it can produce anxiety. The only realms I've played in is um, psilocybin and also ayahuasca. And I think man, I, you went for the <laughs> the strong ass. Yeah, I went, I went right to our mom. <laughs> yeah, wow. Uh, and the reason I did that is because there was a point a few years back where um, the anxiety was really tumultuous, and I tried everything, like going to therapy and doing EMDR, and you know, just meet going through emotional trainings and and just all this stuff. And so what I found was is that when you when I experienced ayahuasca, it took me to a place where not only did the voices go away, but I was connected to something I didn't understand, but I just knew it was there. Mm. And so I can't really explain that with words. I think if you feel called to do ayahuasca, Tim Ferriss said it was like 20 years of therapy in a night. And that's kind of what I felt actually. Wow. So I don't know if you, I don't know if this is like forbidden territory to talk about. Oh God, you mean? We just, we had <laughs> a three and a half hour last night. Last night. Okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> so how, we, how does we can't this, get away from this? How so, does this relate to our wellness? I think it's a piece of it. I think we have all these pieces of wellness, you know, fitness being one of them, technology being another, like doing some kind of plant medicine can be a powerful tool, mm. but you have to be ready for it. Right. Uh, I think people need to do float sessions. Yeah. Oh, I love, oh, they, totally I, I did that. Well, I did that yeah. uh, just one time and I loved it. But how, how much, yeah. you know, it's funny. We talk about anxiety and, and those, the, the, you know, the feelings that surround it. I would, you know, I would make a bet that a, a lot of uh, people's issues with food stem from that, you know, to where they feel uncomfortable a little bit and, or, you know, uncomfortable with themselves yeah. or the situation or, their thoughts or their stress because of their kids or whatever. And here's this anti-anxiety medicine, food. Yeah. Food is very good at putting it kind of it's distracting comforting. you or putting yeah. you in a, in a particular moment or taking away that feeling. I wonder what, I, I, would, I would venture to say that would be a large percent of the problem. I believe it's we train our nervous system as kids and that sticks with us as adults. That's what I feel like. So we know that something takes away our pain at a certain age and then that's coded for later on. So we just look like a go-to. Like if you drink or if you smoke or if you eat food at a certain age, like it's going to filter through. Hmm. So making those good connections with kids is really where it needs to start. Those good connections with food. and I don't know. I think sometimes our parents are just doing the best they can. So yeah. I, I, don't know, I don't know if we can always go retroactively back and fix things. We can just be aware of them as adults, mm-hmm. which is why you guys exist to help people that had really kind of fucked up things happen to them when they were kids, which led to their habits as, as them being adults. Well, I'll tell you what, like uh, I have kids, right? And nothing will blow your mind more than having kids and then realizing 
the shit that you're parenting them with, the way you parent them. Or your insecurities. Right? You, and, 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 <laughs> yeah. and you're doing them out of love, yeah. you know? How it and all then, plays out in front and, of you. And, you're being obje- and then all of a sudden you're being objective about it and you're looking at it and you're like, uh, what am I doing? Like, that's yeah. wrong. I shouldn't yeah. be... Like I should Why am I be getting, getting angry that they my... won't eat their dinner? Yeah, you absolutely. Know? Like I'm forcing this issue and like eat your dinner. Yeah, and absolutely. You know, it's just like Kyle Kingsbury, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> hey, we got to make sure we get a picture <laughs> of that. <laughs> my God, is there anything yeah. we can get you, sir? Yeah. 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 <laughs> I just wanted to. Yeah, yeah nah. <laughs> have a good swim, brother. Yeah, yeah. 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 no problem. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Sweet suit. He's is our, that standard for that, mind pump? That's our bodyguard. Just, you know what? That, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. No, no, yeah. Pal, yeah. Pal's actually he had doubles. His own our, podcast will be started. He used to be uh, is there a pool uh, boy. Used to be a pro uh, UFC fighter. Now he's got a great podcast. He'll be starting. Yeah. So awesome. good guy. Awesome. But yeah, um, I you know having kids blew me away because like, uh, you know, I would get upset with them for not cleaning their plate. And it's coming out of love. Like, you got to eat all your food. Like, finish yeah. all your food. And you have like to eat It's a great this. depression kind of mindset. And I'm like, know, what, like, am, I, like, what yeah. am I doing? Like, my kids are never going to starve. That's, never, that's not going to happen anytime soon. Like, why am I force feeding my kids? Mm-hmm. And you realize, like, all the shit that's taught to you as a child and you grow up as an adult. And mm-hmm. No wonder we have all these issues with food. It's yeah. absolutely crazy. Yeah, man. When I was a kid, food was my friend. Like, that's why I gained weight. Because yeah. food, food allowed all those tension feelings in my chest that I didn't want to feel. It just quieted them. So I can remember like as a kid, even in high school, I would go train and then I would get like two carne asada burritos <laughs> after training. Do you still, so, do you still catch yourself uh, like having, having to deal with the, your childhood stuff? Are absolutely. You, yeah. The difference now, as we talked about before is awareness versus just like reactiveness. Hmm. Right. That's mindfulness. Like real mindfulness takes work. It's not sexy. Right. Yeah. People like mindfulness. It's not always successful, right? Sometimes you fail. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. But, but the thing is you keep getting back on the horse. It's, it's, um, it's being perfectly imperfect. Yeah. Like that's really what it is. And so how can we use people, uh, communities, technology to fortify that knowledge, that awareness? Now, do you think but, at some point uh, being, uh, being aware of that process that you'll end up uh, where it becomes automatic, like yeah. the old process was? Um, I believe so, because I think self-mastery has layers of onions that get peeled. Mm-hmm. Um, are there like things so- now that are, because, I mean, you lost a lot of weight. Yeah. Like, so, I mean, how long ago was that? Um, 2002. Yeah. yeah. Statistically, you're uh, an anomaly. Most people who lose that amount of weight don't keep it off mm-hmm. for any real length of period of time. So, yeah. and you're uh, obviously a very self-aware person, a lot of those processes must be more automatic now, right? Mm-hmm. Is, like, what, what are the, what I do you think find there's in? just always been like this fire of curiosity inside me. I feel that from you guys too. Like, I want to know how things work. Mm-hmm. And when I know how they work, I can better understand how I can optimally be. Mm-hmm. Like the whole self-mastery thing, uh, hopefully all of us that are listening to this are wanting to be better at self-mastery mm-hmm. or become yeah. more self-mastered. And so I've always had just that desire. I don't really know where that comes from. Maybe it's why I like podcasting as well, because <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to ask people questions about why they do what they do. Mm. Um, like Gretchen Rubin's work fascinates me. Just anything that involves behavior change and habits, doesn't that dork you guys out? Oh, or I, I can identify completely, especially from the technology yeah. perspective, because I geek out all the time on all this new information that you know we have access to in ways that... You know, we can understand the body even fuller and our sleeping patterns and, you know, the amount of force we can produce and, um, you know, all these different like cool tools. But but it's just it's just more information for how I operate and how I can optimize like so many different facets of the human body. So I, I totally geek out on that. That's that's what drives me. I'm very performance minded and uh, definitely the uh, getting into breathing and and, and slowing down and, and mindfulness and and that's that's been the biggest tackle you know for me to uh, you know spearhead and so that's that's more most of my focus is these days is like how can I create more space and and be more present with all this stuff I'm working well, on. You, and you mentioned flow. You did you uh, read Rise of Superman or have you? No, but I've heard of it. Oh, oh man, I can't. This, we- this flow state is very elusive, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Pro athletes try to attain it. Yep. Um, actually, the team at oh. Muse just built it into sunglasses. They built in the temporal lobe monitoring to sunglasses so that athletes can do it like before they drop in on a bowl when they're snowboarding mm. or whatever it is. So you you yeah. haven't interviewed Kyler or Jamie Wheel, any of those guys oh, yet? Man. They're on my list. Oh, man. bro, you, you for sure, it, for yeah, sure, yeah, we'll yeah. send you over to the because those were. Okay. amazing interviews Great. and those uh, guys what they're talking about right now and you'll dig this then because what I was so fascinated I read Rise of Superman first and then I did Stealing Fire 
and Rise of Superman, it tripped me out because I remember as a kid, uh, I used to watch like BMX racing. Like Rad was like one of my favorite. Like, oh, God. Oh, yeah. Send me a name. Right, yeah. So, yeah. Right. I just interviewed oh, Dan McDonough, who was in that movie. Oh, yeah. like the redheaded kid. Dude, yes. well, I just interviewed him for my other podcast. No way. No way. That's a trip. Oh, oh, that a trip. Look at this. Look at this full oh, circle. Oh, shit. Oh, That's so crazy, dude. That's crazy. <laughs> so, I'm the only that one jam. that hasn't seen that movie. Oh, and he has, makes fun of us And for as an adult, right? Because you. you guys are all connected to because you're kids, right? As an adult, I'm like, what is this fucking movie? I put it's a shitty movie, but it's great because oh, you guys watch when you were kids. It's fucking shit. It's on, one of the best. It has the best Come montage, on. bro. It's epic. You don't have is it Rocky Four level it. montage? Well, it's different. Whoa. Okay. You know, if yeah, you're if you're that's, spinning, wow. you can't you can't, you can't go Rocky Four. BMX bike. Okay. Okay. It, you know, it's, <laughs> if it's it was BMX. So my point was okay. what I what I found so fascinating about it was I remember being a kid, being into that, watching all that stuff, and I remember the first time a backflip happened. It was whoa, such a big deal, mm-hmm. and then it took years for someone to do a double backflip. And then you never thought it would even be possible that that dirt bikes could do that. They don't do that. Dirt bikes are too heavy. It doesn't make sense. Like, I didn't think the physics exists. <laughs> I didn't think that was physically possible to happen. Yeah. And, and when that happened, and then, and they talk about this in Rise of Superman, and nothing else, and, and nothing else in life have we accelerated um, as fast as we have in extreme sports. Um, the, the growth as far as records breaking records in, uh, on everything, on all sports that we've ever done the last 20 years in extreme sports. And they attribute that to getting the forcing yourself in a flow. It's like die, do or die. You're upside down with a fucking motorcycle. Like <laughs> you, you better slow pretty, shit down. Some pretty high stakes. Yeah, high stakes, right? And, and so that's what they're finding out. And these, these athletes and Red Bull's heavily invested in this. Like that's where a lot of their big their money goes. They're spending a lot of money on helping people get into that flow state. They're it's building. They're building some fucking badass facilities. Yeah, facilities all oh, over the country. Man. You, you know, I who's, can only imagine. Yeah. You know who's investing a lot of money on getting people into that flow state and who's like really fucking pioneering that. You look at tech, tech in terms of uh, like Silicon Valley tech, yeah. uh, like those companies. I mean, those, they they're starting to re like Halo. They are experimenting. What's happening? Like, some of those experiments are working. Some of them aren't. But because all of them are competing for this talent, they're really trying to maximize every bit of freaking brain power they can out of these people. An incredible resource for what you're talking about is there is a digital health. It's rock health. Rock health, mm-hmm. you can see where all the money's going yeah. and all of the oh, wealth, shit. wellness, yeah. fitness. You can see who's spending follow, money on what oh, company. Sure oh, and there's your it, trend reader. That's your predictor. Right? Yeah. So yeah, oh, if, yeah, if, if anybody listening years. is like, I wonder what's going on with wellness and fitness and digital health. Like, see go the to venture rock capitalist health. money that they pour into different Follow avenues. the money in any industry. Mm-hmm. Right. And so that's that's a good place to go. But you're right. Like it's all going there yeah. because people are realizing, oh my God. Um, someone mentioned this at uh, Bledsoe's talk today. Our attention is the new currency. Mm. That's that's really what's oh, going to be most valuable. Good state. Wow. Great, great statement. That's one hundred percent accurate. What a that great at, statement. At, at Who Paleo? said that? Uh, I think it was the guy sitting next to that's Rob Wolf. Which I, I forgot his name, <laughs> Man, but I remembered his quote. Well, it was yeah, it was Bledsoe. <laughs> Shout Wolf. out to that guy. Yeah, Shout was, out to the guy who said the cool <laughs> quote. <laughs> but um, but yet the same thing happens with our data. So what we're seeing in the fitness industry is like data is the new oil. And, and the CEO of Under Armour said that at CES this year. Wow. Data is the new oil. Attention. So is why did Nike abandon it? Because they were beat years ago they got, on the they tech. Beat. Under Armour bought Endomondo, My Fitness Pal, Matt My Run. Yeah. They have the ecosystem. It's mm-hmm. 200 million plus. It's too years. late, right? It's too late. All the changes that we're going to see in the next three years have already been decided. Yeah. And I'm not saying that, that there shouldn't be um, more innovation. But if you look at the where we're going, like we all have yeah, some kind of tech sense. on us right now. Like mm-hmm. you have a watch. I have right. a watch. We use technology every day. Mm-hmm. So we get to be well, more open. Now, to trip it. off this, right? So we're talking about like the behavior, like we need to really change people's behaviors on a fundamental level. Yeah. There's no company on earth that I can think of that doesn't have more data on its users than Facebook. Facebook. Of course. Mm-hmm. Imagine if Facebook got an I believe they, I believe they all world. dominate the, I've right said now. that for so can long. Can you was, imagine if there was like virtual fitness coaches through Facebook? Are you, of course they would know be. everything about you. They'd know when you were happy, know set, everything. your yeah. comments, you, you, know, would be, you, 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 will, you would be able to match the trainer and client yeah. to Perfect. Like a level of like all the <laughs> things you've liked over the last 20 years. Like, oh, by the way, your trainer looks like this, that, 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 all these things that you are into, you talk about, you the things you buy. I mean, it's, we've been Cattling ourselves for the last what is it twenty years now? Or yeah, 15? How long yeah. we had it now? Yeah. How long we've we been in Facebook? Oh, pff, not hasn't been that 15? long. Fifteen, maybe. 15? Hasn't been, I think two thousand six was Facebook. Dude, right? it's nothing. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. When's Facebook? You're thinking MySpace. Ten, ten years ago. <laughs> ten, God, it's ten only years. Ago it's only been Facebook, ten. Right? It's only been ten. So they have ten wow. years of data on us. Yeah. So in ten years, imagine what they've pulled. But they're the most informed 
company on its consumers by far than anybody ever has in the history of the world. And there's, what, a billion users on Facebook? I mean, if they were a country, they'd be massive, and they know everything. You imagine if they were able to get in the fitness industry or or work that information somehow, learn how to get that information and put it together, they'd be incredibly successful. I think it goes back to where we're talking about, just because they know something to people, how are they going to create the bridge from like having data and knowing to making people take an inspired choice? Right. There's still ambiguity there. Like we don't exactly. There's a lot know. of mystery there still. There's well, still a lot of there's mystery. A, there's levels of awareness that that person has to get to before they're even ready for that, and that and everyone's on different levels. So that's the part that's tough. That's what makes it so challenging. I think is to speaking to so many people. It's what we have our greatest challenge. It's so hard to when we know we know that each person has a, a special message that they need for themselves at whatever point they are in their journey. And yeah. to me, it's all that's it's just trying to help everybody get to that next level of awareness and whether that be their relationship with food or the relationship with mm-hmm. exercise or the relationship with themselves. Well, I'll, you yeah. know, I'll tell you, so we, you know, uh, very heavy in the, the whole like uh, co- cosmetic side of fitness, mainly because my goals were extremely, they were based on the cosmetic. I wanted to build muscle. So I was very in that whole world of build muscle, burn body fat and all the supplements and stuff that's around them. And when you, you know, you look at all of that and you see how ineffective uh, it was, um, but how much people wanted to buy it, um, you know, one of our messages really is trying to, how do we get those people? How do we get those people, which is most people, most people who are like, I want to work out, really have goals that work really well for these retailers, for these marketers. And, you know, how do we get to those people? Because their goal right now is they just want to lose weight. They don't really care. Like you talk about wellness and loving yourself and all that stuff. Like, look, I need to lose 20 pounds. You know, how do you get those people Mm. to where you can communicate to them and give them the right information so now they've made lifelong changes? I think you have to embody some kind of polarizing viewpoint that people can connect to. (laughs) Really, polarization is what draws audience. You don't have to be a dick. You you don't have to be like the guy that used to call people fat. Get their attention. You know, or stupid. You just got to get their attention because <laughs> yeah. that's the new currency. So like you guys being you is what draws people to your podcast and what draws people to your online programs and everything. And it's what I'm in the process of creating with Wellness Force. Like I'm still getting clear on exactly what is that channel. Like I know I want to have people live life well, mm. but what is my polarization? Well, let's talk yeah. about that. Let's talk about the, your business and your, pod- in, yeah. and your podcast and what made you go that direction and yeah. you know what are you liking about it so far? What are you figuring oh, out? Where are you at right now with I it? I love podcasting is the most beautiful medium because you're in someone's ear. You're able to reach them in a way that no, and never in history has this been able to be a real thing. And so I'm most excited about reaching people where they are in their busy ass life, in the car, whatever they do. And really like with Wellness Force, what I want to do is I want to give people things they can trust. I want to give people tools so they can live life well. And that's the message behind it. Hmm. And whether that's mindfulness, whether it's exploring physical wellness or emotional wellness, um, it's bringing on people like I'm stoked to share this episode. Mm -hmm. This is something that people get to know because these are all the things that they won't hear if they go online. Right, right mm-hmm. now, we have so much information. The hardest thing, it's almost like we have so much info that we don't have enough info because it's too hard to find oh. the right stuff that we yeah. can actually trust. I don't remember what so, movie it was, but the, where this guy's walking down the street and <clears throat> all these ads just, just pelt him in the face, you know, as he's walking down and they're all like super targeted to him and it's on this crazy level. I just feel like when you're on the internet, that's what it is. That's what you're experiencing. Like just constant, a barrage of ads hitting you and, and people just don't really know how to navigate to solid information anymore. But the cream will rise to the top. I was at on it last night and Sean Stevenson had a question from the audience and they were like, if we're really, you know, caring about what we do in health and wellness, how do we know that we'll be successful? What divides the good from the great? And he was like, get a massive body of work under you, do something for years and years and years, be consistent, be truthful, be genuine. And when somebody finds you years from now, they'll look back at everything you've created Hmm. and they'll be like, wow, this person really cares. Mm-hmm. And if your message has any kind of polarity or polarization, they'll trust you even more if they're a part of your tribe because they'll just love who you are authentically, <laughs> yeah. 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 right? And yeah. so I'm in the process of creating that. So I'm at like mm. 120 right now on the podcast. Mm. I've interviewed some incredible people that like we all respect. Yeah. Um, and so I'm really interested in figuring out my specific voice. And I don't even care. Like I'm just being honest with you guys right now. I think a lot of people try to have all their shit together yeah. and like be perfect. Mm-hmm. But this is such a cool, I don't know, maybe you guys so are- Sorry, have you identified your polarization? What you, how you? Yeah, I think 
I think really like right now for me today, 2017, my polarization is around the people that don't think emotional intelligence and emotional health have anything to do with our physical fitness. Mm. That's my polarization. I think the bullshit mm -hmm. that's been in our industries for a long time has been like, eat less, move more, suck it up. Uh, you know, do your best, work hard and everything great no will happen. No days off, beast yeah. mode. Right, but it's, <laughs> but, it's, but it's like, how does that take into effect our stress load, our cortisol, our emotional health, our decision-making power, our decision fatigue, all these things that we've learned from like incredible people like Paul Check. you know, just the way that wellness affects us is so different now because we're in an age of technology where our attention and currency constantly under attack for our attention bandwidth. So we have to approach wellness in a completely new way. Mm. There's no way that we can compare where we are now to 10 or 20 years ago when maybe the whole calories in calories out model worked then. I don't mm. know. Cause well, we've, like, we've, okay. I mean, the, the, the numbers are easy. Um, it, they're, they're simple is what I should say. Not easy. They're simple. We know people know what they need to do uh, generally, they might not be super informed, but generally to be healthier. They know they should move more. They know they should eat less. They know it's better to eat more vegetables. They know it's either better to eat less processed foods. They know these things. Um, but what they're missing is what people who are, who are, who've done it for a long period of time, people who are consistent, people who love it, what they're missing is what those people have. And they have a different experience with food and with exercise. They experience exercise not as, gosh, I need to move, yeah. but like, I can't wait to move. I mean, this is so much better than watching YouTube or, you know, Netflix or going on the internet and Facebook or whatever, or, you know, this is what I really enjoy doing. They have a different connection. Same thing, same move. Now, people are, are on this side or, or running or moving or walking or exercising or whatever. Same thing on the other side, but for some reason, they have a different connection. And that comes from what you're talking about. It doesn't come from, here's your numbers, move more, eat less, here's your packaged food, now you're eating less calories. Yeah. We've already answered, answered the problem. That is not the answer. The answer is getting those people to connect to those things in ways to where that's what they prefer to do. And then it's easy. It also comes from intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. If you look at self-determination theory, uh, intrinsic motivation is sustainable for a lifetime. Extrinsic motivation is dependent wanna, on everything else. I want to look yeah. sexy for my yeah. wedding. I want to look sick for the beach, whatever it is. Like that's temporary. And I can remember the first time I tried to lose weight, it came from anger. Mm -hmm. I was pissed off. Most, most was, of us are. If we're honest with ourselves, yeah. and we tell, we share this on the show all the time. What drove all of us uh, to most of our success in in fitness and in other things was our insecurities. Let's be honest. I mean, I was the skinny kid who didn't want to get made fun of for being so skinny, and that's what put me in the weight room, wow. hammering the weights like crazy nonstop. Wow. Sal was the same way. You know, each each of us have had the these insecurities that drove. In fact, uh, if I'm honest with myself, man, I was a fitness manager for ten years. I must have had hundreds of trainers that worked for me. All of them. The, the, the ones that everybody looks up to have some of the most most issues that they're still dealing with. You know, here these trainers are training these clients, but a lot of them are, they still are finding themselves. They don't yeah. realize, uh, and that's what I have a hard time. When I look at the fitness industry as a whole, especially when you look at social media, when you look at like Instagram and shit, which I know that's bad because it's, that's not an example of the entire fitness industry, but the direction we're going with, you know, everything being on social media and having to be connected that way. It's the these, new website. Yeah, it is. These, it's a new website. It's the, uh, it's now I I'm starting to see, uh, with, and it's sad because there's people like you and us and, and like this great place we're at paleo FX, but you're still seeing us, uh, we're losing the race still because you've got all these, these trainers that are pouring out terrible information because they don't know better because they still have a long ways to go in their, their own personal journey. Well, hopefully they figured out the mathematical piece. They under, they figured out protein, carbs, fat, yeah. you know, if it fits your macros, train hard, beast mode, and it got them to where they, but they have so much deeper shit they have to get through. Well, we just got to be louder, I think, and be I actually more that. effective. We got to yeah, be more effective. You have to be louder. We, we just have to be more effective yeah! at, at communicating. I mean, you were talking about being motivated by, by anger, but yeah. obviously you're not angry anymore. Mm. But you're doing it still. How did you move past that? Mm. Such a great question. I found something bigger than me. I think anger is always about us. It's a selfish thing. Ego. We're, we're pissed off. We're pissed off at our mom or our dad or whoever it was that didn't give us what we think we needed. Uh, meanwhile, radical ownership in life comes from just accepting what is. And so when we accept what is, the anger goes away. And it's not about just us. Mind pump, wellness force, whatever we're paleo effects is not about the entity. 
It's about what the entity is serving. So I feel like that's the true answer. So you just you just no longer angry because you. Uh, was it the difference between exercising and eating right because you hated yourself and exercising and eating right because you loved yourself? I think it was facing the anger that I had inside that made me eat in the first place. Mm. It was understanding that the anger is what made me have these bad decisions be in my life, uh, like food or mm. even like, you know, there was a phase where I was drinking a lot too. Mm. Even as a trainer, I would like train clients all day and then I would go drink and party at night. And mm. then I'd wake up, you know, three hours later and go train 10 sessions. And it's like, I was living a false duality. Uh, so how did I transition? Mm -hmm. I transitioned by taking real ownership of my anger and apologizing to people that I had upset. Oh, wow. Going through a few different specific courses. One of them was uh, called MITT in, in Los Angeles. That was pretty powerful. Hmm. Um, experiential learning places where you can release stored anger and take radical ownership. A lot of people go to Landmark for this. Um, but I did a few of those and that made the big difference. And I'll tell you uh, even more transparency, like that anger was still there the first five to six years I was training. The anger was still driving me. Um, did you but, apply that at, when you were pissed off and you were a trainer? Did you find yourself, were you, tra looking back now, were you training people not as good as you could have because you were? If I could give people back for the first two or three years of me being a trainer, I would love to. I would also say that. Yeah, because oh, I, you know, I, I'd get Just some, hammered them? Well, I, I, you know, we'd, we'd do an assessment and mobility and then I'd periodize them and I'd ramp them up and they'd be like sweaty and then they'd be stoked. But then I would just crush them mm -hmm. because yeah. I felt like that's mm -hmm. what they wanted. Right. But I didn't have the emotional awareness or the intelligence enough to figure out what do they actually need? Yeah. You know, like what do these people really need? And so if I'm honest with that, the first three years of my training, I would probably give the money back. Well, and that's what I mean. I mean, yeah. yeah. But yeah. That's, and that's yeah. a lot. That's still, there's a ton of, that's the ton of trends. And that's, uh, that's what's hard for me is to sit back in silence when I see a lot of this stuff on, like I said, social media where these, these train trainers and I have air quotes are, you know, cause some of them are just virtual coaching trainers and they're giving out all this information because they got, you know, 2 million followers, the amount of people that they're impacting and you're, and I know what they're setting them up for. And if I, and I can't come on there and, and say anything because that's, that's not the tactful way for me to do it. All I can do is to continue to try and provide good information where we're at, but it's talk about a challenge when we live in this, you know, this fake virtual world. I mean, I don't know how many times I've met somebody who, uh, you know, I'd seen on social media and they put off this facade that, you know, this, this life of training this way. I mean, half of these, these guys and girls are shooting photos in a six week window and they have all this professional spread them all yeah, throughout the year, spread them out through the entire year. And they're putting this and they're making people believe that this is how they look year round and they've got it all together. And you just got to train mm -hmm. harder. If you, you got to want it bad enough, you, know, you don't want it enough. If you don't have the, and it's just, it's an illusion. Yeah. It's a total illusion. And it's, I think it's, it's making things worse before it's making it better. I mean, it's uh, with all the technology and all the great tools we have and what we've learned about mm -hmm. the body and where yeah. science is coming, the fact that obesity is still on the rise. Well, you, make, just, a good, you make a good point because uh, uh, people's issues with body image are, and I've read statistics on this now with kids, especially young girls, uh, is just getting horrible. 35 minutes to plan the right selfie. Yeah, it's yeah. getting really bad because they're going through Instagram and going through all these pictures mm -hmm. and it's like fit chick that looks a certain way, perfect angle, perfect lighting, whatever. Next, next, next. But so you get mad when they, when their friend dude, tags them and they don't look good enough. Dude, right? think about it this way. Like when we were kids, it was bad. There was still lots of body image issues, my God, you know, 20, 25 years ago. But that, and a lot of that was based on magazines that kids saw sometimes. Like they're looking at their phones all day. Like yeah. we're, we're, we're dealing, we're going to, I think we're going to have to deal well, with We're it. inundating them an with ep it. An epidemic of body image issues uh, and um, my one thing that makes me hopeful is I'm seeing a trend and I don't think it's not huge yet, but I'm hoping that this is the direction everything goes of just being real, uh, yeah. realism. Um, you're starting to see a little bit of backlash to the whole perfect, you know, whatever. And I'm hoping that continues because I mean, I have a daughter but and I have a, a son. Here's, like, here's where you get to ask yourself is, is, is it really though? Or is it in our world? It seems like. You know, when, when well, we, I, we know, look at our small little bubble. I'll tell you why I think it's a trend, a real trend, because um, celebrities that were once untouchable 
now will do their own live Instagram video or their own live picture and they're posting their own stuff. Yeah. And they're you're start- humanizing themselves. They're, and I think that's a strategy now. Mm-hmm. It, mm-hmm. It, it's become a strategy to separate yourself or make yourself look as which is fine. I like that strategy. Keep getting more real, keep showing yourself in your more unflattering, whatever, so that these people looking through these pictures, these kids or whatever, aren't developing these horrible See, I don't you know, know if body I, images. I don't know if I think it's a trend. I think it's just the counterculture to to that and it's you know, the pendulum has swung this far and now it's trying to swing back and we'll probably go the other extreme. I don't know if it's a, an actual sustainable type of trend versus it's just the answer because, and we know that what, uh, medita- uh, meditative businesses and shit like that, your retreats and uh, sure. yeah, those are up by like 80%. I mean, and that's because we're getting so plugged in that we're not disconnecting. And so now people are having to go find these places, Dude, I have which an really can just breathe and fucking do some stuff at home. I have but, an online you know. client that just went and did a digital detox. Right. It's yeah. like it's like a, it's, it's exploding. But that, what I'm saying yeah. is, what's unfortunate, it's exploding as another band aid to what the real what the real problem mm. is going. Well, on. the real problem is that people are hungry for experiences. Right. People mm. want experiences that make them feel great. Yeah. They want to have fun. They They're, want to enjoy their that's life. Why soul cycles. Kick so ass. so yeah. <laughs> of course, there's an eighty percent increase in in retreats and things like that because people are thirsty for something real that they can actually have fun with yeah. instead of just like being connected on social. I mean, how many times have people reached out to you and been like, I love what you're doing or, you know, I really connect with this message. But like, if they were to meet you in person, like this is a conference you guys will be at and people will be coming up to you and meeting you. Like, that's what we're all here for. Yeah. And that's what you can't get online. So these tools, this social, this tech, whatever, it's the intention behind it. I think people forget that. I mm. think that people forget that a lot. Well, and it's it's easy for all of us in here to say this because we're a different generation. I mean, you talk about Generation Z now, which they came they come out with Snapchat. Like they don't know anything other yeah. other than that. So it's hard to get that the the message that you're trying to get across and we're trying to get across is is only getting more difficult. I think as time goes on because these because these kids. Yeah, they don't people. know how to detach. Yeah, and it's beca- and they're and it's and it's getting pumped faster and harder at a much quicker rate. So even if we are doing all these good things and meditation is on the rise, I feel like it's uh it's a never or we can't win because of uh what how they're brought into this world immediately, you know. And I think that's the that's the conundrum that we're all in is how do we how do we impact those people and tell them that when They've never seen anything but that. They don't know different. You know different. We all, we grew up, like you said, in pager era. I knew it was like to go knock on a kid's door and say, hey, do you want to come out and play? Like, yeah. you know? Yeah. But these kids don't know that. That And that that reflects to every area of our life. Um, Amanda Steinberg, she came on the show and she was talking about how people really want women specifically, they want men to be analog in a digital world. Analog meaning old school. They mm. want men to physically go up and talk to them. Mm -hmm. And people are scared to do that now. It's like, who cares if you get rejected? Like, train your nervous system to get rejected and make it okay. And that's the scary part, that social media, it's creating this false facade where people can have perfect selfies and perfect life. You get the freaking highlight reel of who they are. Mm -hmm. But what's missing right now is the vulnerability piece, where it's like, hey, even as men, like, uh, men are scared to approach women more now than they've ever been before right? because yeah. they can just go get whatever they want from social. They can just go get that same neural response from social. Right. And that's the scary part. And it's the same thing with porn. It's mm-hmm. the same thing with anything. It's that too dis- easy, too easily accessible. Yeah. We need to become uh, a little bit, a lot more delayed in our gratification. Well, do you, you know yeah. that like uh, cre- well, erectile dysfunction is at an all time high? Yeah. Of course it is. At a for, younger for age, even like yeah. 20 well, years old getting, that never existed before. You, well, you're literally training the brain that way. I mean, it's, they've actually shown physical changes in the brains of young men who watch lots of porn online. It's a, uh, it's a, a system of perception. That Andrew was, Hill, Andrew, Dr. Andrew Hill talks yeah, about it's this. It's a system right? of perception that was based on a certain level of scarcity and non-variety, uh, just like the system of the way we, when we perceive food. Same thing, by the way, food and porn. Very closely connected. I'll make that connection for you. But. And together, awesome. Absolutely. Like a ham sandwich on your chest and a laptop. Right. Out. I mean, that's, that's my Saturday night. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah. Right hand on the Just sandwich, FYI. left hand on. <laughs> but yeah, um, you know, when when with with porn, right? These these guys are seeing these images one after another and opening up different tabs, and it's creating a scenario in the brain that would have never existed through most of human civilization. Where they're getting this constant uh, new stimulus 
this, uh, what do they call it, a uh, novelty effect. Mm -hmm. And it trains the brain uh, to only react that way to where you have these 20-year-old guys who are having issues getting a boner with their girlfriend when, you know, that's never supposed to happen at that age. Mm -hmm. The same thing is true for food. We evolved with these perceptions for tastes and, you know, uh, palatability that were, that evolved in scarcity. You know, like if you tasted something sweet in nature, it was likely accompanied by vitamin C. Vitamin C otherwise is quite hard to find. So you better believe you crave the fuck out of that sweet taste. And when you found it, you ate the hell out of it because you're probably not going to find it again for a little while. But now we live in the modern world where you have whatever you want all the time, just like with porn. Anytime you want it. Anytime right. you want it. Any flavor, anything you want. I mean, we engineer food at such a scientific level. The amount of money that goes into engineered processed food is insane. Like these foods... There's, there aren't foods that exist in nature that are this palatable on all these different areas. Sweet, salty, the, the way it tastes, Bright, the color, color yeah. the smell. Like They have really well, narrowed I share on I share on Mind Pump all the time. Shit, I don't think I even ate any fruit until I was like 25. Because I was allowed oh, cereal and candy and like... Man, I grew up on welfare. So, Seriously. So did I. So, okay. So, so like we're talking kick cereal, government cheese. Yes. Mm, right? mm. <laughs> and that was basically it. So like for me, a big treat would be when we got to go to Burger King. Right. Like that was awesome. Right. And so that was what was wired yep. into my limbic system. Yeah. So my, that novelty got coded into my limbic brain. And so now as an adult, I just get to be aware of that stimuli mm -hmm. all the time. It's in there. I, I not still, only that, but there's physical change. Like well, that's need what to I say. I, I still trip out on the day. I mean, I remember it clear as day. And I never, I never noticed it as much until when I got into competing. When I got into competing and it forced me to be unbelievably disciplined and eating all whole foods for like all the way up into a show. It had so it's clean, like 12 weeks. Yeah. So it cleaned my system out. And I remember like biting into a strawberry one day and being like, never in my life did I like strawberries. It was just, I didn't even care for them. They I were ate candy. bland. I ate candy all day. Exactly. It was, they tasted like nothing to me. I didn't. I couldn't taste a blueberry, strawberry. Your brain literally could yeah. not. It just didn't register I mean, because I, it wasn't used to that little of that. You know those signals. Yeah. What is this shit? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and when that and when that Eek. happened for me and like I've ne and I haven't craved or wanted candy in God knows how many years now, but I never knew that I could love fruit as much as I love fruit now because I was I had I totally desensitized my body. Feed them grapes. To, <laughs> to. For, uh, to that sugar and because uh, I was getting such an overload of it all the time mm. and so I find that really fascinating and how many people probably go through that and don't realize it. it's like you may actually really like that type of stuff if you would just clean your well, system out. I think this is why a lot of these 30, 60, 90 day challenges work so well. It's because it cleans out and kind of does a hard reset on the limbic brain, mm -hmm. which is why people go through frenetic withdrawals. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. and they start scratching at the this cupboard. Is why so. fa this is why fasting is actually quite effective for a lot of people. Now, right. of course, fasting, if you have really bad uh, relationships with food, uh, fasting can actually make things worse. Um, of course, it can lead to extreme forms of, you know, starvation and whatnot. But fasting itself, if you, for, for a lot of people, it does that. Like you fast, you don't eat for a while, Things feel heightened because they become heightened. Literally, things change in your brain. And then when you go back to eating, rather than becoming hedonistic and eating all this, you know, quote unquote bad food again, start eating the healthy stuff. And you would be surprised at just how palatable, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kale is. You know, it's here's a trip off this. They've actually have evidence that suggests very strongly that infants, uh, their brains learn what to. Uh, what to find palatable based on what their mother ate when they were in utero. Yeah. Now, from an evolutionary That's standpoint, crazy. this makes perfect sense, right? A, a, a baby being born into the world will probably should be find the food that they're going to be eating uh, when they're born or as an adult, as a child, palatable. So it, the brain actually starts to wire itself in utero based on these signals that from, sent from the mother. Uh, but a lot of people don't realize that those, that brain's wiring although a lot of it is done by the time you're a certain age, a lot of it is, is malleable. So you can change a lot of these behaviors or at least the cravings that lead to these behaviors quite a bit with you know being smart about what you're eating. And understanding that is very strong for some people. Like when I had clients, one of the most successful techniques I used is I was very good at informing people the actual science of what's happening. So here's what's happening in your brain. 
when you're eating these sugars. Here's what happens when you stop, and you know you're going to get a better dopamine release now with you know strawberries versus you know candy that you were used to before. And we'll go down the list, and I'll explain it to them. And then when they understood from a scientific level, then they could be like, oh, that's why I'm feeling these things. And they became more connected to what they were feeling. And then from there, I was able to get a lot of them to change their habits. What I'm feeling from you is people have to unlearn what they've learned. Yeah. And that goes mm-hmm. back to like the beginning of our conversation when we were talking about emotional intelligence and what we absorb one, years one through seven. Everything we take in, we have to unlearn as adults. So what are the things out there that can help us do that? That's a real question. Yeah. What are the things that can help us relearn what we've learned that doesn't well, I'll serve t- us. Well, I'll tell you something that, and I, I was actually searching for you to drop this tool because for me, one of the best tools that ever came out was, well, it was originally Body Bug. Uh, before, oh, yeah. The and Body I, Bug. And yeah. I'll, tell body you, bug. I'll tell you how, oh, yeah. to me, that has- We uh, sold those like crazy. Oh, <laughs> evol- yeah, I know. That, it was like 200 cool. bucks. And it was like 400, 499 right? when they first came oh, out. And then I'd sell them a box of Apex cookies. That's right. That's it. Yeah. Apex right. cookies <laughs> and Body Don't worry. They're good for you. Yeah. But what what I what I realized was a big game changer for me was when this one hour, you know, I, I, I prided myself so much on being great at programming and, you know, putting together this diet. And I realized like all the other hours in the day, like you were talking about earlier, that they don't see me. And I started thinking to myself like, man, I'm really not helping these people whatsoever. Like it's it's crazy. Uh, when I showed them uh, their Fitbit and I would uh, body bug back then. Yeah. And I would show how many steps that they would have in a day. And it tripped me out that the average American was stepping about 4,000 steps a day. And if we were to go out and we'd walk for one hour, all of us right now, literally just walking uh, for one hour, we would step like between six and 7,000 steps. So that means that my client in the entire day- That they're awake. That they are awake <laughs> for 24 hours. They didn't even- well, chilling, less than 24. Walk around and move for more than an hour of time. And yeah. that just was like, holy shit. And I'm putting all this focus on how hard I'm working them for that one hour that they see me. If I could just get my people to increase their movement and activity throughout the day and throughout the week, I can impact them. And that alone was such a game changer. Well, I, I, you know, I would say, and from, that was just the awareness. Yeah, is that, that's it. It's the awareness. That's piece. It. it was just because in their mind, they're busy. I was here. I had to pick up the kids, and I want to do this. I started at six a.m. I didn't get done till midnight. You don't understand, right? Yeah, you don't understand. I was. I'm moving. I'm busy. Yeah, no, I'm you're active. Not, yeah. You're not moving. Yeah, and then when you look at it and you you help them connect those dots, to me that was that was a major game changer uh, for helping people put that piece together and and help them be aware of how active they really mm-hmm. are. Yeah. And and then understand well, you're always playing catch up when you actually see them. Well, this this is the number one thing. It's like when people get little reminders, little touch points, little nudges to make better choices through smart coaching, through wearables, that's a, that's a huge difference. Like why do you think that Lifetime Fitness and all these major chains are putting so much money into wearables and tracking right now? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's not because there's not a huge opportunity. There is a multi-billion dollar oh, it's, opportunity. It's massive. That we're talking about that I've it's been making work for the past year and a half. But the only way it's going to work is if somebody's committed emotionally first. So well, data, data is awesome. Yeah. But I feel like our whole show, we've just talked about awareness, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's about the awareness, dude. Yeah. So if, if, you have the the tech to, if you have the tech to uplift the awareness, awesome. But if you just want to be you know, savvy on tech, that's not going to help you. Right. No. Right. No, that's that's like to me that's what we find wrong with like if it's your macros is you know it's the first level of awareness is being able to track and understand that but then if you get stuck in there which I found in the competing world this was crazy you know I remember when I first got into it I thought oh man it's going to be great like I'm going to be hanging out with the most elite physiques out there I can't wait to pick these brains like yeah. get around them and I remember brilliant minds. getting in my first show and like asking guys questions that have done this, you know, the nine shows yeah. under their belt. I'm on my first show and by myself, no coach, anything. And I'm talking to these competitors and asking a lot of questions about their nutrition and how they were training. And I'm thinking like, what? You have a coach? Your coach told you? Okay. And then, and then I remember thinking like, well, okay, this is the amateur level. Maybe as I work my way up and then I get to the professional level, I'm thinking, okay, these are going to be the guys that fucking, I mean, these are pros. They all cover the magazines. Like these dudes are going to fucking know the shit. And I remember getting in there and asking the same questions and realizing like, wow, these guys are not only are they really don't understand uh, anything more than how to work really hard and restrict the fuck out of, out of calories they would go on these crazy binges afterwards. I'm on, I'm on, I'm on season, off season, and it's like, 
that relationship that this elite person who's got millions of followers on covers of magazines, giving out all this information to help people have one of the worst relationships with food and exercise uh, than the average client that I would take over. And they're the ones delivering this message. And that's when I realized how fucking bad it was that the, the elite of elite that people looked up to or that we look at it on our magazines Ooh. Um, have some of the the, the worst relationships. Well, I mean, l- looking at tech for the last you know five years, w- one of the most effective things that I've seen that has come out that's actually worked, not sold. It did sell more than anything, also, but it also got a lot of people moving. It got a lot of kids moving. Was the Pokemon Go thing? Oh yeah, <laughs> it fucking worked. It well, legit. We got- Fit actually did. It. Pretty decently. We too. fit did another one. Let me yeah. tell you something. Yeah. Do you know how fucking hard it is to get kids to do shit outside now? Yeah. It's like a punishment. Oh, it's you're the right. opposite of when we were kids. Yes. When I was a kid, it was like you get to go outside and play now. Yeah. 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 Now I'm like, get your ass. I mean, go outside. You're like, talking about attention currency, yeah. right? Yeah. How long? <laughs> I got to be yeah. outside for how long? Thirty minutes. Okay. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's like my God, yeah. And they stand outside, don't even know what to do. Right? <laughs> they have to win things to go outside. Well, I can just picture your kid right now, like go outside. He's just standing at the door for thirty minutes, waiting for his yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Pokemon. <laughs> Bazaar. Yeah. Where are you? <laughs> okay, man, I'm done. Yeah. Po- but you know, Pokemon Go did a good job, and the Wii Fit did a good job of getting people. What happened to that? Did it keep? Did it die? Yeah, it's done. It might. Have died, but yeah. look, there's a ton of game gamification yeah. ways to make kids move more. There's For a sure. ton of them out there, yeah. and gaming. we're seeing it. I, I got hit up on Twitter by this guy. He's a he's a PE coach in um, the East Coast, mm-hmm. and he uses wearables, and they have this big screen, mm-hmm. and they all have to jump around so that the characters move on the screen in a more fun way. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's so cool. we can use technology for these kids to make them realize, like, oh, when that's I that's how we're gonna get them. See, that's how, that's we what gotta gets get me them early. Excited, we gotta it, get them early. It gets a, it brings it back to play too, which is uh, you know it's a lot of what uh, where we've gone away from fitness. I feel like you know from physical education. Obviously, we've we've kind of moved past like even putting a lot of money into that direction. Like we've taken programs out of school and like different options for kids to have to even be physical anymore. And uh, that that's the kind of stuff that gets me hopeful in that if we can create, recreate that that sort of that fun vibe, that that feeling that's inviting for these kids that, you know, they're obviously getting stimulated like this from their Xbox. You know, can we just take that same uh, sort of feeling and that 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 fun thing to do with your friends and now make it physical? You have to force them at first. I hate to say that. I, man, I know. Because they're tough. your kids. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I, well, I went to Yosemite with my kids, right? We're out there and it's fucking gorgeous. And at first, my kids are like, oh, you know, what are we doing? Like, when can we go back to the hotel where we have the Wi Fi? And I'm like, guess what, kids? This entire trip, no electronics at all, no TV, no nothing. And we're out there. And Everybody we'll, cried. Uh, oh, at first I was like the worst dad in the world, right? Like, oh, I'm such a fucking asshole. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm being so, you know, but let's see what happens. And we're walking. Uh, I, I think we were going to go see Bridal Veil, I think is the, the, the waterfall. It's just fucking beautiful. And we're walking over there and there's these huge boulders along the way. And I'm telling my kids like, we'll go, you know, go play, go climb. And they're like, I don't want to, I don't want to climb. And then I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, why am I not climbing? Like, why, why am I standing over here telling them what to do? It's like, fuck, I'm going to go climb some boulders. Yeah. So next thing you know, they joined me. And I swear to God, the rest of the trip, my kids were begging me to take their shoes and socks off so they could feel the grass with their feet. They were running around outside. It was like pandemonium. Luckily, nobody got hurt because, you know, of course, you're a big paranoid parent nowadays. <laughs> Anything without a helmet is dangerous, right? But... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It was it was great. I could just see Sal, tape. Could you imagine yeah. Sal putting his kids in helmets when they're just running outside the field? <laughs> Hold on. Come here, come here. He's like wiping his face real quick. Yeah. <laughs> but Stay there. Uh, but you know, they had a blast. I think you have to fucking force them. And it's funny too because you've got this this epidemic of like ADD and ADHD, and it is an epidemic. Like kid like kids are prescribed a hell of one of the best things you could do, by the way, this is clinical, one hundred percent proven. Your doctor yeah. will tell you, even the the doctor that's prescribing you the Ritalin will tell you this. The best thing you could do, one of the most effective things you could do that's non-drug is get your kids to move. Mm-hmm. It's so effective at dealing with ADD and ADHD. I was going to bring this up earlier where yeah. it was like leading by example. Mm-hmm. If you lead by example, like your kids watch what they do way more than, than listen yeah. to you. Uh. So I have a 13-year-old nephew and it was like really hard for him to do certain sports. But then when he started having fun playing the sport, he was like in momentum. He was loving it. But he needed that push. And that's parents' job. Like I'm not a parent. So I have mad respect for parents. 
but I can only imagine what it would be like if the parent wasn't leading by example and if the parent didn't want to make the kid feel uncomfortable to make them physically active. That's a recipe for disaster. Well, which is another issue that poor trainers have to deal with right now. It reminds, God, I remember this time I had this this guy come in and he brings his, I think the kid was around 10, 10 or 11 years old and he was overweight and he was buying him personal training and he's like, you know, I, he needs to lose weight. He needs this. And I'm like thinking like, I'm cringing, like listening to the way I'm ta- like talking in front of him. Oh, his like, kid's like right his there. His kid is quivering. Next yeah. To you know what? Oh, I'm quivering listening <laughs> to him going like, oh my God. Dude, we've all had like, those clients. And it's like, yeah. and, you know, and it, let's be honest. I mean, it, it's, I, I need, I'm over here as a trainer and I'm trying to make a sale so I can have a client and make money. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm listening to the father saying that going like, oh my God, you can't say that. But if I say something right now, I'm going to piss this guy off and he's just going to, he'll either walk out and buy training. And then you can't help him at all. Yeah. I can't have one all. So I'm just like sitting here listening. I'm just thinking to myself, I'll wait till he goes and then I'll hopefully build this kid back up. And I'll never forget. I think it was like his second visit with me. And uh, I was going, I was looking, his father wasn't there yet. And I was like, where's your dad? Oh, he might be on the car. And I said, okay, let me walk you out. I'll walk you out to his car to see, make sure he's there. And he's sitting in the car eating fucking McDonald's. uh, Waiting for his kid. Waiting for his kid. So the kid's in the gym working out with me for an hour. He's in the parking lot eating McDonald's and he opens the door and it, the, I just never forget that smell just hitting me in the face going like dude what what are you yeah. fucking doing and you think you're doing your kid good because you bought you spent a thousand dollars on me you know to train him and push him you know to get him to lose you know I, I feel so bad and I feel so bad for those people because you know that the father hates that about himself so much probably that he's like you're not going to be this way mm-hmm, to his kid mm-hmm. but he doesn't have the I guess the strength uh, or the awareness or just to even care about himself enough to do it for himself. You know what I mean? So he's just like, look, kid, you're not going to be like me. I'm spending $1,000. I'm going to force you to do this. And then they're in their car just feeling shitty and can't really do it. I mean, it makes you, makes you sad, right? Yeah. It's- Pe- people aren't swayed by anything other than emotion. And emotion for kids is watching how their parents behave. Right. Per- period. Mm-hmm. So like your kids, like you have a, you have a road cut out for you, man, where you're going to have to really be the example that you want them to be. And that's not always easy, right. especially in this society where your attention is under attack all the time, which then delineates your mindfulness and your awareness. That's the real issue. Oh, let me tell that's you, the real issue. let me tell you, when you have kids, you like, uh, I, here's a great story. I was driving home one day, I had my two kids in the car and, um, was in a bad mood already. So I'm in a bad mood. I'm in the car, I'm driving, we'll go pull around the corner and there's these Teenage boys playing basketball in one of those uh, those hoops that you roll out to the middle of the street, you know, the ones that, with the, the water filled base or whatever. Yeah. And they're playing basketball and they kind of slowly get out of the way. And as I'm driving by, one of them throws the basketball at my car and it hits the window next to my daughter. And it's boom, real loud. And I look up and as a father, you get real protective, right? And we're talking about like behaving the way you want your kids to behave, right? So I get real protective and I'm a, I mean, I'm a papa bear, 100%. So I, Flip the bitch. I go back. These kids scatter. I get out of my car and I pick up the freaking basketball hoop and I slam it on the floor like a gorilla. Like, <laughs> ah, you know, <laughs> don't ever fuck with me. I get in the car. King Kong. I get in the car and I'm driving. And my son, who's probably eight at this time, yeah, I think about eight years old. And he goes, "Wow." He goes, "Um, you got really mad." And I'm like, "Oh fuck, man! I totally the way I acted." So I'm like, yeah, I did. So I didn't say anything yet. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I got angry. And he goes, uh, why'd you get so angry? And so now I'm trying to think, like, how can I defend, like, my behavior? Like, I got out of the car and I broke someone's property. So I said, hi, you know, I just got real protective of your sister. I mean, I felt like, you know, they might have hurt her or whatever. And it just makes me get this emotion where I got to go back and just, you know, scare them off or whatever. And he goes, it's, you actually put us in more danger by turning the car around, pulling up to the, to the basketball you know, hoop, opening the door, getting out of the car. He's like, you actually put us in more danger. And I totally apologize to him. And it really makes you, you want to talk about self-awareness. Mm. Like, wow, I need to behave in a way that I would want them to behave. And that was such a stupid decision. And that's just a funny example of you know, one time that happened. But think about all the examples that we give our kids through the way we eat, the way we talk about ourselves. You know, More kids develop eating disorders not because their parents tell them that they're fat, but because their parents constantly talk about how fat they are themselves. Man, I can remember so many Mm -hmm. times in my life where my dad would look at his stomach and he'd be like, look how fat your dad is. That's stuck. That's burned in my memory Mm -hmm. forever. Wow. And I think that's just one example of what a lot of people go through. Like, by the way, he did the best he could. Sure. That's part of the emotional healing is like just recognizing like, well, how did his dad treat him? 
Right. Can I have compassion for that? Right. Because there's been many moments in my life like that that I remember that were just like burned in like cattle prod brain yeah. that were just so unhealthy and so not positive for somebody to go through. That's, and you're right. There's always a choice for you as a dad or a mom or whoever it is, caregiver. There's always a choice, man. But the choice is not always easy. Like your emotions took over, <laughs> you know, you lost the awareness, but then you took radical ownership, which pff, that makes it all okay. And now, I'm, and I think hopefully that became the lesson. The lesson was <laughs> wasn't go break some shit when people <laughs> piss me off. Hopefully, the lesson yeah. was like, wow, my dad made a bad decision and he totally owned up to it. And so now, maybe if I make bad decisions, I can own up to him. Like, how powerful is that? Oh, right. yeah. you right. know how Talk hard about it was. Emotional intelligence. Can, like, do you know how hard it is? Well, just your son to ask you that question. I think yeah, I'm thinking powerful. how smart is his yeah, son oh, to smart. ask that yeah, question, yeah, right? Yeah. Oh, my kid fucks with me all the time yeah. like that. But it's like, <laughs> so good though. Oh, but you, great radio. But I tell yeah, you, yeah. I tell you, man, you 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 talk about uh, a test. Like, I'm all, I'm pissed off. You know, of these stupid kids throwing a basketball that you almost could have broke the window. You know, like I would go out there and like, you know, Incredible Hulk everybody, right? You know, uh, I, I'm angry about that. And now I've got this eight-year-old trying to tell me what I did wrong. Nobody wants to hear that from an eight-year-old. Yeah. But you, you know what? When they're right, they're right. I don't That's give a it. shit who tells you the fucking message. <laughs> right. You can learn sometimes, from anybody. Doesn't sometimes it's a little kid, old. you know, and yeah. you take that message and you go, oh, all right, you're right. What, I gotta change that. What perspective for him to see it that way? Well, you actually put us in more danger. That way. <laughs> yeah. I think about right. it. You know? Man, you know what's really cool is like you know profound. the clarity your eight year old had. We all have that clarity all the time. What gets in the way is like the dirt and the soot of all the distractions we have in life. That's right. what gets in the way. Mm -hmm. right. So why do people need a coach? Because they've just allowed themselves to become distracted. Good coaches cut through the bullshit. Yeah. And they get you from A to B. So I think that that childlike intuition is what every coach is really coaching. Right. It's coaching us to get in touch with the inner child. Mm. Do you have Do you have any yeah. companies um, that you watch right now, or that you're really intrigued by what they're doing, what's going on with them? Do you, you or do you follow a lot? Is you there a what? few you really like? I'm really stoked at this conference to uh, talk more with Dan Party from Human OS okay. because he's blended self quantification with paleo and ancestral lifestyles, Interesting. and he's put those two together. And they've done a ton of research and meta analysis about the Mediterranean diet. And um, just some really solid programs. Interesting. So I follow Human OS. I think like if we can combine self quantification and natural ways of living, like eating, moving, sleeping, the way mm -hmm. that we're designed to, if we can do those two things together, that's going to be the answer to this technological revolution that we're seeing. Tech is not going away. Right. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm trying to figure right. out, what I'm in the process of learning is like, how do we use the other side of the sword where we can cut towards people's progress using technology mm -hmm. instead of allowing technology to just make people sedentary and disconnected. Right. Make it worse. Or we could just, well, there's another choice where we just turn our head and, and don't give a shit, right. but then technology is going to do whatever it does. Well, yeah. let's talk about so, how challenging that is as an entrepreneur who's trying to build a business when it's easier for us to, to buy into the bullshit, the gimmicks and to hop on board with all let's the- Let's make some money quick, but then lose our integrity. No, yeah. let's not do that. Let's play the longer game. Yeah. You guys are in it for the long game. Yeah. For I, think, sure. I think the people Absolutely. with the, the greatest integrity are not interested in how many Instagram followers they can gather. Right. Mm -hmm. So human, human force. That's the name of that one. It's called human, human OS. OS. Oh, human OS. Are you familiar with that? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the, yeah and they're here. They're here. Uh, I think they're going to have a booth. And, and honestly, you guys, like, I believe, I, I know you've talked about nootropics on your show at some point, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, <clears throat> Qualia and what Daniel Schmachtenberger is doing, they have a booth at, at PaleoFX. The way that their nootropics have up-leveled people and allowed just the clarity to exist. I mean, mm -hmm. talk about like increasing your bandwidth. Nootropics, Dr. Andrew Hill talks about this. Jesse from Smart Drug Smarts mm -hmm, podcast mm -hmm. talks about this. If we have more decision-making power, then we won't succumb to decision fatigue, mm -hmm. AKA it's 9 a.m. or 9 p.m. and we won't look at the chips or a busy mom won't look at the chocolate mm -hmm. and make that emotional decision because mm -hmm. she'll been able to have had more bandwidth for decisions all day long. Yeah, yeah. I, like so. the, I like the direction uh, of nootropics. I like that they're now talking about the, you know, supplementing uh, your body and mind in a way that helps you become more optimized on a total whole level. I like that message. I just think that that you can accomplish, or most of that is accomplished through the way you live, the way you think, the way you sleep, and that's the part that I really, really want to focus on. And that's why we're not making any money on supplements right now mm -hmm. because nobody wants to partner well, with us. Yeah, because you know, we talk about that so often that it's so just on the other side of the coin from that. We've been talking a lot about nutrition, but you know, like to talk about quality of movement and how to to provide these 
these better patterns, these better recruitment patterns throughout your day to optimize your posture, to optimize your strength, your mobility, all these types of things. Like, uh, do you see any kind of technological advances in that direction? I love getting a push notification if I haven't stepped for an hour. Because sometimes if I'm at the computer, let's be real. I'm just like working. All of a sudden, my wrist buzzes mm-hmm. and I'm like, oh, movement snack. I have a trail by my house. I'll just hit the trail for it. It's crazy minutes. how it's the simplest things, it's right? Just a, it's, it, look, it's, yeah. it's the KISS principle mm-hmm. that, that really works the most. Mm-hmm. Uh, basic movement patterns. When we look at like Juan Carlos Santana was my mentor back in the day. I went mm-hmm. to IHP in Florida and like did his mentorship. And he's like, listen, we only do a few things. You know, we have level change. We have lunging and twisting and pushing and pulling. That's all we do. So master those things and you don't need a lot of time to do it. You can mm-hmm. do all those in five minutes, right. yep. five minutes, yeah. every couple of hours, just a quick reminder. Oh, do my movement snack. Boom. Uh, fre- you know, frequency is key. Frequency, 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 frequency is, actually- is key, which we've touched on a few times, like 13 hours of sedentaryism versus one hour of like a, you know, a, a crazy wad or like doing Murph and then <laughs> sitting for 13 hours, you know, that's not going to help you. No. So I, I think push notifications from tech to answer your question are okay. huge. That's what I've seen with my clients be the most successful is like, uh, they're not with me, but what can I set up for them so that they feel like they're with me? Mm, it, it's right. the little notification. Now, what do you do when they say, when they stop listening to the push? What's the conversation at that point? Then it's you and me versus your data. Okay. It, it's, hey, how do we partner together to figure out how we can get your data mm-hmm. that reflects the progress we both want for you? Mm-hmm. And are you not keeping your promises to yourself that's really what it is but it's not a guilt thing it's not like hey you're not doing your shit sure sure it, it, it's more around like hey we're committed in the intake you told me you wanted this mm-hmm. um this is what we need this week for you to get there let's do this together mm-hmm. that's what it's really about what's a what's a day look like for you are you still training a lot of clients do you- i don't train in person at all okay you know everything yeah. virtual. i haven't trained i haven't trained a client in four years okay in person but i have a video library i use nudge coach i coach everyone online and so that's how I keep them accountable. Hmm. And like tonight, before I go to bed, I'm going to look at everybody's stuff and send them quick messages. Now, this is cool because I, I, yeah. I did online coaching for uh, about a year and a half. And really, I did it just so I c- could get involved in it, see what it was like to try and scale it up, like how much I could scale it on my own and then yeah. what it would take to build something larger than that because I see a piece of that uh, feeding into Mind Pump down the road. And uh, I was I was really fascinated in the opportunity with it because I think there's a lot of bad coaches out there and there's a lot of ways that I think if you have a lot of footage and content and now some companies that you can use videos and apps to really get connected to somebody and really work on those things because let's be honest the the workout part is 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 a very small sliver of of the help that you, they really need from you right so I I think that. Uh, there, where where it's going is really cool. What I had a hard time with was once I started getting beyond like ten to twenty people that that range. It's hard to manage. Yeah, yeah, it felt really tough to. Yeah, I, I think right now I work with uh, less than twenty. I work with like sixteen, seventeen. Okay, people. so you okay, you found the same thing. But That's but, what, but the value that I'm giving them yeah. is increased accountability, which means I don't have to have so many clients. Right. What crushes trainers is is coaching from five in the morning till ten at night. Right. Because they have to. Yeah in order to make money. But if you can charge enough because you're giving somebody tangible value based on increased accountability, dude, that's the future of fitness. Right. Mm-hmm. That's the future of what all these clubs are trying to do. They see it before anyone else and they're trying to see how they can, um, you know, there's two ways to look at it, either parasitic or capitalize on it. Either, either way, they're going to make their money, these clubs. Mm-hmm. Right. So how are these clubs going to use virtual coaching compared to this traditional model that we all know is probably to supplement their physical brick and mortar facility. It's probably come in here, work out and you get this online, Mm -hmm. you know, this virtual support. And we're talking about 24 hour fitness. I mean, we we've watched that. They've been doing that for the trainers. I mean, their pay and what a fitness manager makes there now is it's crazy what it is. It's Mm -hmm. like an hourly. I think the fitness manager makes like 15 bucks an hour or something Mm -hmm. like that. They, it's a terrible, pay you can tell that they're they're trying to go just like they were doing with the sales people you think they're trying to eliminate it, that i think i think they're trying to eliminate all of it eventually you'll come in to, to get your membership it'll be like swipe okay your card. yeah swipe yeah. your card i want oh upgrade to mm-hmm. a virtual coach for six weeks that costs this much virtual coach for 12 weeks costs this much oh i want the fat loss program oh, i want the muscle build and then you'll get uh, and it'll have the 24 fitness app or whatever mm-hmm. company we're talking about how we'll have their app and it'll have all the videos logged in and but you know it's missing what a human being yes. right yeah. yeah right and that's why these people won't let go of old weight because yeah. <clears throat> there's no human being watching it. Mm-hmm. Tech is great. You have to have a human, mm-hmm. an educated human directing it, mm-hmm. controlling it. So I don't think trainers need to be scared. 
I just think yeah. trainers need to evolve. Yeah, until yeah, AI evolve. comes out, make it just more, evolve. That's yeah. it. Just like don't be yeah. so resistant to the changes. Right. You know, like yeah, I, I yeah. see a lot of these. You got to uh, grow with it. Yeah, I, 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 that's probably how they would do it because they're losing ground right now. These big boxes are losing ground to the small boxes. Small boxes they're are growing. dying. Orange yeah. Theory is crushing it yeah. because they're creating experience and they're implementing tech. Yep. Yep. They're using like MyZone and all yep. these different tech yes. pieces. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So this is, I mean, it's like, it's crazy. We're in this time where there's so much change that it can feel overwhelming for any like health and wellness pro. But then we're in this time where there's so much opportunity. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. So oh. It, the duality is pretty hard. Oh no. Uh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm yeah. excited about some of the nutrition information that's getting out as well. It's like all the stuff that we grew up believing about fat, about, you know, what was healthy, you know, what you needed Non-fat to eat, milk. all yeah. that stuff. Like it's all been turned on its head. I just read, uh, you know, uh, I shared this on our, we have a private forum that we share a lot of these articles that we find. And I read an article that basically the whole sodium, you know, eating too much sodium, you know, uh, uh, that we've been told, you know, by doctors, a lot of it's bullshit and eating too little sodium is more dangerous for you than eating too much sodium. Have you guys heard of the and, salt fix? Yeah, There's no. some guy that just wrote a book called The Salt Fix. Uh-uh. I'm going to try to interview him because okay. what you're saying is correct. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and I'm, it's like all this information now starting to finally come out and people are starting to question. Now, of course, you go to, you know, you go to the supermarket now and you're seeing foods that are, you know, they're trying to market to some of these kind of, uh, these buzzwords and these key terms and whatever and you know, uh, now you've got supplements geared towards fasting and here's the new fasting shake. And it's like, that's not fasting. It's a shake. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but you are getting the information now seems to be a little bit better. I think, you know, like paleo, paleo diet, ancestral diet, Mediterranean diet. Those are all, uh, much more accurate in their information. One cool thing. Cause you guys asked me what companies am I following in human OS, Dan Party's company. He did it, this meta study. He came out with a course and you know, what really made the difference for like blue zones and nutrition uh-huh. it wasn't their diet. Mm-hmm. It was human Community. connection. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was a big one. That that's the, what they all had in common. <laughs> that was the missing piece. It was more important than the diet itself. Well, that's what Fitbit, I think, has led, you know, bounds over everybody else that was trying to get into that space. They created that with the intent to pair each other and their friends and their family. And so everybody could kind of cheer on and have that sort of with a good tool because with I thought, with a good tool because Nike made, try to make it and they made it sexy and it, super like connectable, but it was terrible in technology. It was awful. It was super terrible, inaccurate. And then they just focus super on athletes, yeah. which that's why they quit. Athletes don't yeah. need, yeah, yeah they, they were, they it was, the they got, you could tell, I mean, that's, and that's why I, I could never recommend. I remember I went out and bought it. I went out and bought it because I, buy all the toys and try them out firsthand. And then I start diving into them. And I mean, it was like, I think it was 45 or 60% accurate to people's, you know, BMR and stuff. I was like yeah. so far off. I'm like, that's, that's not helping me. <laughs> so <laughs> like, I, I have the blaze and cool. I, I did a split test from the radio pulse to the brachial pulse. And the brachial was so much more accurate because you get a stronger signal, especially mm-hmm. people that have like tattoos, like, like you would not work that well with yeah. like a Fitbit. Right. Yeah. And so it has, it shoots light emitting diode into your skin and it measures back. It's 10 beats off per minute. That's so, huge. Wow. It's 10 beats off wow. per minute. So I don't use my heart rate tracking here at all. Yeah, if yeah. I wanted to get like a really specific heart rate tracking monitor, I would get it at the brachial pulse. But let's be honest, 90% of people just want to let go of weight. Right. Yeah. They're, they're not interested in like HRV and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, that's for your Strava people. That's that's yeah. the fringe. But then there are people that need the fringe. And mm-hmm. I bet you a lot of people listening are wanting some of this heart rate variability data. They, of they, course. It's important to them. Yeah. But a lot of people, man, they just want to feel better in their body. They just want to feel at home in their body. They yeah. want to let go of some weight. Mm. Yeah. Favorite, uh, favorite guest that you've had? Mm. That's a really hard question. How about the worst? Oh, yeah. Let's go that way. All right. Be, I, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say truthful. their name. I'm not going to say okay. their name. Your but sign it, language is them? People will figure it out. In my first 10 shows, <laughs> I interviewed like a bunch of people from the fitness industry because I was just starting out. Like sure. I didn't have any guests. So sure. we did I, the hit same up, thing. I hit up on my friends, yeah. you know? And and one of them, one of them is a woman and it was the most canned non-emotionally open conversation with the same kind of perform better verbiage circuit that she had pushed out for 10 years. Mm. Uh, And that, it just made me feel gross (laughs) to have the conversation. But I think, you know, what I'm really interested in right now is like physical and emotional wellness. That's my path. That's what I'm trying to learn. I love, I loved Rob Wolf's episode. Just absolutely. He crushed it. He talked about things that I don't think he's talked about on other shows. Mm. Uh, I don't know. I haven't listened to your episode yet. So oh, check that out. Yeah. yeah. But, um, and I also love Tom Bilyeu's episode. I thought Tom Bilyeu crushed it mm-hmm. on wellness for us. I think that he's one of the most, when we talk about emotional intelligence mm-hmm. and, and positive psychology, he's one of the top guys. 
Like yeah. he he is up there with the just, highest just of the, the highest. business genius. So I felt yeah. so I think uh, for wellness and that side, Paul checks my guy. Tom Billy has been my business guy. I think Tom mm-hmm. Billy was like well, I'm. I'm so fascinated. I, I was just telling somebody last night. I'm like, if you're not watching what Tom is doing right now, what he's building, like, and you're in this space, like, mm-hmm. you should be slapped because he's literally doing it before your eyes, and he's fucking killing it. Now, mind you, he's coming off of, he's got a shit ton of money. He also <laughs> has a massive team yeah, in exactly. Beverly Hills at so, his mansion yeah, that so, like run his show. Yeah, he can afford. He can <laughs> yeah. afford. You know, we were bootstrapped. You know, we did. We uh, yeah. <laughs> all yeah. All of, all of us. Uh, well, you also have each other. Yes, that, mm-hmm. that's that's pretty rare. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What you guys have created, yeah, we mm-hmm. which is why I've like I've really yeah. enjoyed this because dance. I can feel that you're you're a team. Yeah. Oh, we yeah, yeah. we def- we definitely. You know who was a great guest that who was one of our early guests, and it was in the old studio. So when we first when we first started, we first started recording. It was in Doug's living room, and then we had this little like box studio that we kind of you know we foamed up the walls and everything. We're like, this is where we're going to do our recordings. And he was one of our first big guests. Is Tate Fletcher? Mm. He comes in. Oh yeah. And we were like, oh, fuck. Like, Dude, the be power outage. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. Oh, so, and shit. we're like, oh, fuck. We're going to have Tate on the show. Like, he's like, you know, big fans of his. He was a, uh, M- you know, MMA fighter. He's got caveman coffee. Just cool dude, right? So he comes in and we're like, nobody. He walks in and the dude made us feel cool. Like, he was just, made everybody kind of chill. We sat down. We started talking. The fucking power goes out like 30 minutes into the episode. And I'm like, are you kidding me? The power is going out. Like we have, yeah. like, our, one of our first like big. We guests. blew it. Yeah. And, he, and you know what? We just kept going. Doug turns on his iPhone, freaking light, and Tate's like, no, no, no keep going. Let's have yeah, a great yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, this fucking dude's great, That's man. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. He it could have been it. a totally. It could have been a ruined interview. Yep. But the guy was like, no, no, let's keep going. Let's do this. No, and, Tate's po- and he's a great guy. Podcasting mm-hmm. is such an art form because anybody can like ask questions from a list, right. but to have a real conversation that has direction and has meaning, that's an art form. Mm-hmm. And that's what I am in the process of getting great at is directing that art form. And I really look up to people like Tim Ferriss and Tom Bilyeu, incredible yeah. interviewer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I think- He's an incredible storyteller. That's he's an incredible yeah, storyteller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's why, I mean, you- He's a great guest. I, re- I remember the, the, the first time that we had him on the show. It was funny because we were just going through something. Uh, currently, we had been- dumping money into something. We had a big event, all this stuff going out. Uh, we had a slow, slow week business. And so I felt the stress on me. And I, I remember he was in, he was in studio and he was talking. And I remember being like before the interview, like my mind was elsewhere. I totally was. And I caught myself and being frustrated with, oh, where are the business at this and that. And it made me, and I was, and then I all of a sudden I got sucked in to him telling his story and he pulled me in so much that it, it took me from being one way all the way to another extreme. And then I totally reflected on it and went, wow, I'm like, I get so focused on the day to day and in the business and like, how fucking awesome is this that I get to ask this man questions, anything I want to ask him. And, and right before that, we had Rob Wolf, right before that, we had Paul check. We just had, I mean, the lineup that we had in the last, that those two weeks and how I was worrying about some bullshit, like, I mean, I could have spent my whole life and never got to speak to a man of that that level as far as business uh, intelligence, self awareness, yeah. and then someone like Paul Check, and it's like, man, those were really power. He's a really powerful storyteller. Check is awesome too. I mean, I think he was uh, super, he's polarizing, mm-hmm. and not everybody can handle him because of the way he delivers yep. his message. But he's a very intelligent, very self aware uh, man that was really cool to hang out and with. And he's a badass. Yeah. I mean, he's a legit badass. Well, his results speak for themselves, right? Well, like one of the things he talks about, the four doctors, the four, yeah. the four doctors. <laughs> yes. Yeah, he's, yes. say, he's saying yeah. that to us while yeah. he was painting in between, in between sets of deadlift. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it was great. <laughs> See, and, and by the way, San Diego local, okay, like Vista, that's where the Czech Institute was formed, yeah. right, in San Diego. And um, I have so much respect for him because he was doing that before anyone else. Right. Yeah. When we, when we when people at, were calling him kooky well, and crazy. When we look at holistic yeah. lifestyle. Oh, like, he started that. He started it. Oh, yeah. yeah. He's like the Jack Lane of wellness. Yes. <laughs> I mean, exactly. That's, great that's, yeah. that's Paul Check, man. Totally. Yeah, he's he, the man. We had, yeah, I had yeah. a great time talking with that guy. It really blew my mind. Yeah, we've, it's, uh, podcasting has been just such a fucking blessing, right? It's been the I best. I get to talk to people. It's been the best thing in my life, really. Yeah. Like, look, it's allowed me to meet you guys. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Po- podcasting has been such an incredible, uh, re- relationship maker yeah. and mm-hmm. memory maker for me. Um, I've been able to grow in so many ways. And a lot of it is, is getting out of fear as well. 
Like sometimes I interview these big people and I'm like, oh shit, I'm about yeah. to interview this like really, I respect this person so much. Don't fuck it up. <laughs> <Yeah>. Breathe. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So Excellent. yeah, podcasting is awesome, man. It's, it's been such a joy. How long have you, guys, have you been on? Uh, almost two years. Oh, good. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, almost two years. So I feel like um, one of my early mentors, I joined this podcasting group, John Lee Dumas. You've probably mm-hmm. heard of him, mm-hmm. Entrepreneur on Fire. And he was like, I really found my voice at about a hundred shows. And I feel the same way. I feel like I'm like more relaxed now. I feel like I can really connect with somebody and talk about the things that are going to serve someone else instead of just being in my head. Oh, it took us a long time to get the dynamic of the interview. So we did over 100 shows by ourselves before we we even did with each other. What? Oh, yeah. yeah, Most of our, when we first started, it was just us three. And we just, the three of us have just great chemistry. So it was like right right from the get. I mean, we got better because we, we, we were able to relax a little bit, but we had great chemistry with each other. As soon as we threw a person, another person in that to interview, Chemistry was all off. Mm-hmm. It took us a while to really yeah. uh, learn that. Stepping on each other's toes, sounded really formulaic where we were asking the questions <laughs> yeah. like an interview. It was awful. Not really listening, just waiting awful. to ask the question. Yeah. You know, it was I, yeah. just oh, a I, lot of static. I used to there. have fans yeah. that'd be like, oh, I love the episodes where it's just you three. And when you guys have guests, it's not it's that. Like, yeah. That's I was like, damn it, we got to get yeah. better. That's what I've been stepping into with Wellness Force is like the only thing really missing from the show is just episodes of me talking and teaching and educating. So that goes back to the polarization thing we were talking about. Right. Like, how do we polarize by being our freaking selves? Right. Yeah. Well, this is just why be unapologetically just be yourself. This yeah. is why like, like yeah. you know, cross promoting like this together where we will drop both these on both our podcasts is, you know, you get a chance to have a conversation with God on your podcast. I bet you your fans will love this. I think they're going to connect to hear you in a way they've never connected with before. Right. Yeah. And that's what we had that with Lane Norton. Rob told us that like all these guys that um, had been podcasting for a really long time. It's going to be our first explicit episode too. Oh, <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> really? Because we don't cuss on the show. Oh, all, no. Wow. The majority of my audience Uh-oh. is like busy working moms. Oh, oh no. They want to get more. In- Here we no, go but again. you know what? Hey, wait. Gotta, I'm going to say a little <laughs> warning. A little warning. If you're going to come over to my episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very explicit. Now our, yeah. now our message You've been coined as the Howard Stern of fitness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, nice. now our, yeah. our our message is very much on good relationships to food, good relationships with exercise, like understanding yourself, loving yourself, uh, nourishing your body, nourishing your soul. Um, but we, you know, we're three bros that talk like that, and so you're going to hear some bad words. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what's funny though, like you yeah. know that these words are dropped by the very moms or people in general that would say them themselves behind closed doors. Yeah. Actually, just, we just have just a the, huge female mm-hmm. audience. That let yeah. them. It's just the fact that it's like perceived, like, oh, why are they cursing so much? It's like, well, yeah. can you just get past that and realize that those words are placed in there for impact, right, and, and not just for filler? And I feel yeah. like when we first started, and I'll be the first to admit, oh, this, the very first, the, ner- the nerves, like when I go back and I listen and it's oh god uh, it's painful to over do the now. top yeah too many <laughs> you can hear, moms. yeah you right. can hear our nerves swearing it's, a lot it's like when people say yeah bro fucking i went yeah. to the store fucking, fucking. fucking. Yeah, yeah. what are you doing <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing right. get to the point <laughs> yeah so we we did a lot of that at the, at the beginning you could hear all of our nerves so now i think where wherever it gets dropped in there i felt like it's but really it's just we just the thing is is like we're just when, when me adam and justin are in a room together and we start talking, it's com- we're in the flow state. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if the podcast is on, if we got the mics on or off, yeah. it's always the same. Uh, in fact, uh, I had Adam and his uh, girlfriend over uh, not that long ago, and m- after they left, my girlfriend was like, you and Adam just fucking, like nobody was around. You guys were just talking and going crazy. It's like, we all have this chemistry, and so whatever we feel like talking about, we talk about, and however passionate we are, it comes out. And sometimes it's it's unfiltered and it's it, it, it's a genuine look at, yeah. at us interacting. It's yeah. not like oh we're joke around. We're not reserved about, about it. Yeah, because yeah. I mean going into it that was definitely a concern, especially for I think more so on like me and Doug's end of it <laughs> because you know just the professionalism Sorry. aspect of it and um, you know that was a big concern and it it it, it, it was just so liberating once you're just like. Ugh. Let's just stop. That was our Let's motto stop with first. this whole yeah. yeah our, our trying first to shirts please were zero everybody. fucks. Yeah. yeah, we sold t-shirts. That said and then zero. it just yeah. from then on we just wrote it out like that. And I think I think certain people appreciate it. Of course, certain people will get offended right away because it's it's not part of the way they talk and interact with people. And I get that. You know, it's yeah. not for everybody. But I mean, if you're if you're gonna try and not like that, then if we go from here and we try and correct that, it, it just it's. Now, well, now it doesn't work. Well, happen. let's it doesn't there, work. There was not only is it being true to ourselves, but there was there's also us being we were trying to be polarizing about things. We knew too that 
we weren't going to take on academia. We weren't going to go after there and try and say we're the smartest guys in the room. That wasn't like going to be our message. We're going to be ourselves. That wasn't a winning message. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But we knew we had a lot to offer and a lot to share and a lot of experience. And we know a little bit about fitness. And I think that we also didn't want to pigeonhole ourselves just in fitness. And that's why it's mind pump. And yeah. We try to branch out and do a lot of different. In fact, well, sometimes we actually have to go and say, "Man, we need to do a fitness pod episode." We've done yeah. like five, six episodes and haven't even talked about fitness, yeah. you know, because we really like to try People and expect this. Yeah. Well, and it's, I think it's good, uh, you know, if you love podcasting, like we love podcasting. I think is that's just a great way to challenge yourself to branch out to other topics. Otherwise, we do we end up pigeonholing ourselves mm -hmm. into this one demographic of people that will that will only appeal to where i would love to see the evolution of our show uh to where it's seven days a week and you have segments so maybe you are somebody who you know just mm -hmm. can't handle swear words and i that's fine i, I respect yeah. that and i can put we could put together a show where we keep it as clean as possible and then it's family fridays ten, you know, ten minute about, episodes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but but hello then I, sal Yes. How, how are you? I'm yeah, I think, I, think, I think it would challenge uh, our skill set to do that. And I think we could still deliver a pretty good, uh, impactful me message to people. Because I would love to get into the schools and to churches and places like that that I think need the same, same message. They're getting fed the same bullshit as everybody else. Sure. You know? So, And they obviously, uh, Mind Pump, Raw Fitness Truth is probably a little too raw for most of those places. Yeah. So Not I, for I, kids. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm excited that we're the first uh, cuss. So we're yeah. the first cuss words on well, this podcast? Well, I think there's been a few peppered in, but not as many as this one. Oh, yes. So, but I think what Fuck yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but I think what people will, will connect with is the way that we've explored topics in the most genuine way co compared to when people just go deep into something just to sound smart. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think this has just been a real conversation about how all these topics intertwine yeah. mm -hmm. and why people should give a fuck. Right. right. Excellent. Oh, Excellent. Yeah. Great a, time, man. What a, yeah, yeah, what a awesome. great way to great tie time. it in there. Do you like to do a sign off or? Um, I really enjoyed being on the show. If anybody had got upset with anything I said or is curious, like I'd love you to reach out to me. It's Josh at wellnessforce.com. Excellent. And we still have 30 days of coaching for free at mindpumpmedia.com. Also, if you want to ask us any questions that we can answer on our Q and a episodes, Head over to Instagram, go to Mind Pump Media. We also have personal pages. Mine's Mind Pump Sal. Adam's Mind Pump Adam. And Justin is Mind Pump Justin. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now, plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump. <laughs>